as dumb as I am. I'm not near as intelligent as you. I can't speak the words you can speak. I am not you. And even I can look at this photo and I can say, whoa, something's wrong. It put tears in our eyes when we walked in there. It was that obvious. Tatiana, I'm going to be quite honest with you right now, okay? One parent to another, right? And I'm going to try and control my emotions, all right? I've been to a child death investigator school, and I've seen photos and images of children that have been malnourished. And I'm telling you right now, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. Oh, no, really? Yes. These are Tatiana Fusari and Seth Welch, a couple from Solon Township, Kent County, Michigan. When Seth found his daughter Mary unresponsive in her crib on August 2, 2018, he dialed 911. But after 90 minutes... How long ago did you find this child? Uh, in about an hour and a half, I um, was waiting. I called my lawyer first thing to ask, you know, what's the next thing I could do. And they said, wait till uh, they're here to call. Uh, basically, it got to the point where I was waiting so long, I just kind of went ahead and did it anyway. And we were almost here, so I was just, I was, I was waiting on legal counsel. So you so, found the child an hour and a half ago? Yeah. And called your lawyer first, correct? Yeah. Okay. So Is I, there any other children in the home right now? Yeah. Because I don't okay. know if I'm supposed to call the police or not. I, I have no idea what to do. Okay. We will send someone out and we're going to investigate. Um, when was the last time you had contact with a child? Uh, last night, um, about last, yesterday afternoon, about 3 uh, p.m. You know, she goes to bed. And, you know, that was that. Okay, so you put her to bed last yesterday at 3 p.m.? Yeah, and then this morning at like 10-something, we finally went in to check on her. like, okay, it's been way too long, so, um, yeah. It's been kind of long all the time, it's normal, so. So you're saying it is normal for your children to sleep from around 3 p.m. until 10 a.m.? Uh, you know, usually about 9, 9.30, yeah, so. They sleep from 3 p.m. to... I'm just taking on a couple of things here. Sure. What time do they usually have dinner? Oh, uh, well, this, this is my instance. They're not all... They, they don't all kind of run out of the schedule, but she's... You know, she basically eats and... Uh, you know, she's up for a half hour after that, and then she goes down for bed. Okay. And how old are the other children? The man, Seth Welch, waited for an hour or more before contacting police or seeking medical assistance. It is shocking to know that he found it more important to contact a lawyer than to care for his daughter, Mary Welch, who he described as dead as a doornail. Surely no father could be that cold and distant. However, this was just the beginning. Seth seemed nonchalant from the beginning. On top of that, the couple had legal counsel even before they reported the incident. So, the interrogators knew that they needed to apply powerful strategies because Seth and Tatiana came prepared. They decided to opt for an emotional and easy path with Tatiana so that she could open up, while leaving Seth alone in the interrogation room for about an hour to build some pressure on him. You will now see the interrogation footage of Tatiana Fusari. Kind of go back a few years even just to get to know you and your family a little bit. So okay. do you go by Tatiana or do you have a nickname? Tatiana. Tatiana? Okay. Nickname doesn't really seem to work. You can just give us a Easy nickname. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> How many children do you have? I'm sorry, five. Three. 
three. Okay. Yep. Right. And is it, yeah. The detectives asked some questions about Elizabeth, her eldest daughter. Four. Is she in any kind of daycare? Does she go? No. Does she have preschool? Um, no, I homeschool. I have my um my degree in early childhood oh, education. Oh, you do. Okay. So I Good for you. Thought I just from being at home at the farm, I can at least give them an initial education before yeah. they do decide to send them off to the grade school. Absolutely. She is fluent in her alphabet, her numbers, at least up to 20. Yeah. Um, although she knows other numbers, like 100 and 60, but not in sequence. Um, okay. She's practicing her writing. Mm -hmm. um, she just has a little issue with the numbers. They get a little backwards. But, um, okay. She knows how to spell words like hi, cat, dog. Oh. Um, she knows the list that starts with E. She kind of do better than Jason. <laughs> the hi and the cat and dog part. After getting a pretty good idea about the environment that Seth and Tatiana were raising their kids in, the detectives wanted to talk more about baby Mary. All this while, when they asked questions about their eldest daughter and the birthing method the couple preferred, the interrogators were subtly trying to build rapport, laughing and engaging with Tatiana. Now it was time to address the main thing. Mary as, as well, which obviously you're going to want to talk about her, but it'll probably be difficult today. Was he excited about that? Yeah. Was well, he really? Good for him. Wait, or you were a few minutes early, however we want to word it, right? Sure. <laughs> Depending on who you ask. <laughs> right. For a mother who had just lost her child, she seemed very cheerful. Tatiana seemed to have a detailed answer to every question, which begged just one question. If Mary was fed the way Tatiana claimed she was, then why did the autopsy results say that she had not eaten anything for days on end? Now, these detailed answers could be what Tatiana did for her firstborn, or she had planned every answer when Seth was discussing the course of their case with his lawyer parents. But most likely, it was Tatiana's nature, especially because according to her, she did not have a great marriage with Seth. He would often physically, verbally, and sexually assault her. And those who experience abuse get pretty good at lying and making up convincing stories. Oh, she was. Okay. So in about so a she... month, she was already she was going to start solid food. So I would have... Um... Uh, frozen solid food of like uh, breast milk mixed with like, cream spinach and peas and ice trays. And then you can defrost that um, even in a Ziploc bag in the microwave. So was, was at four months, was she, was she uh, developing well? Was she getting to be a roly-poly? How did your kids develop? Um, I, every, every child is different, I know that, but... They all were very um, engaging and active. And uh -huh. Yes, Roly Poly is a great way to describe all of them, actually. Okay. Um, the only thing they were late on was uh, walking. Okay. So, would you say, like, chubby cheeks and. Uh, that, or was she always thinner? She was always petite. Always petite. Yeah, she was never. Nothing chunky about her, just. But. Petite. But nothing concerning either. No, no. So she was still fitting into the size diapers and yes, stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So basically, the first four full months, she was fresh from the source bre breastfed as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And same story. If you went somewhere, she went with you. Yes. Seth never had to feed her. No. So and for four months, anyway. he never fed her. No. Okay. No way. Not that he couldn't. I just no. But why? Yeah, why if you're right there. To, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was winter cuddle time. I just, mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everyone is innocent until proven guilty, but there is something so evil about the parents whose children seem to die as a result of neglect. Yet, they still manage to smile, smirk, and laugh. It might not prove their guilt, but it does show their cruelty. So, at six months, other than a little bit underweight, you considered her to be appropriate size. Yes, and okay. developmentally as well. I mean, she was... And she was doing real well developmentally. And... Yeah, she was already putting her hands on the floor and, and just looking around. We mm -hmm. have a play mat, and we call it. We give her tummy time. Mm -hmm. um, so especially on days where I'm off, we'll just be playing all day tummy time, and she'll be on the, her stomach, and she'll have her head up, looking around, watching the other kids play, or have table time, which is where they do their schoolwork. Um, the cats we cuddle with her, which is adorable. Um, mm -hmm. She'd roll over on her back, and there's like a little um, balcony, not balcony. Um, it looks like a rainbow, but it's over the head of the baby, and she can... Oh, I have no finger to dingle with. Yeah, 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 she reaches her yeah. arms up, and she'll grab at them and pull them down, and then, like, giggle at the sound. Mm, like, she's okay. interactive. Okay. So, so you felt that she was developing good at that point. Yes. 
and you're educated in this area, so I am. if there's anyone that should know, it would be you. I mean, I probably so. better than us two. Uh, I'd like to think so. Paid for all that education, it should help, right? So, because you're educated in early childhood development, is that what you said? Yes. At six months, have you done a diet change? She, fruit, mashed up fruit. Vegetables mixed with breast milk, so the vegetables include um, whatever we were growing, which were peas, spinach. Um, we got organic carrots from the store. Um, that, tend, that was a little fibrous, so I mixed it in with some peas. Um, mm -hmm. The fruits were blueberries, strawberries, apples. Um, raspberries. She likes the raspberries. So when you mix it in with breast milk. Explain what is what do you mean by that? Oh, so I would um I would pump I would pump some milk in a bottle and then I would we have a juicer or a blender. Uh -huh. So I would um blend the vegetables. So for example the pea spinach. Okay. I blend the spinach in there with a little water and then I pour the breast milk in there just so it was um easy for her to swallow, like oatmeal. So then then she eat it with a spoon or out of a bottle? A spoon. Okay. It was solid enough for her um either set their eyes to feed her with a spoon. So now, at six months old, was she using a bottle at all anymore? No, she didn't need to. She was, was still she, nursing. She was still nursing? Yes. Okay. It was actually chilling to see that while recalling all these specific moments, not once did she tear up or feel emotional. In fact, she kept smiling almost throughout her interrogation. Notice her body language. She was in a confrontational and confident pose. She probably believed that the interrogators were believing what she was telling them. What's the most she ever had her weighing that you can recall? 12, 12 pounds? 14, 14 pounds? But Four. it, was, it was a while ago because the cat got to it. Okay, so at, at, she weighed 14 pounds at about what age? Six months. Six months. Okay. And that was during, before, or after before this growth? Before the growth started. Oh, so... 14 pounds before the growth spurt, so you would, what, as a mom, what would you guess her weight that she would have gained? After the growth spurt? Yeah. Maybe another three, three, four pounds. So Maybe seven. Maybe not even. I'm just, let's go with two. Two? And, and again, I'm just asking you to guess things that you don't know. I'm yeah. Really here nor there, but I'm just wanting to know just the kind of ballpark as of what you think at least. Mm -hmm. um, so you would guess her to weigh 16 pounds at, at the conclusion of her growth spurt? Yeah, she definitely felt like it. According to Tatiana, Mary weighed around 16 or even 18 pounds when she was 6 months old. But when she died at 10 months old, her weight was mere 8 pounds, which is how much a newborn weighs. Yet neither Tatiana nor Seth noticed that there was something wrong going on. So recently her, her, um, her um, schedule changed again. And... When you say recently, about when ish was that? Three days ago. Oh, three days ago. Okay. So three days ago, what what happened then? We would. Um, so three today is th Thursday. So uh, Tuesday was it Monday? Tuesday? What, Tuesday? You remember what day that you were specifically remember it changing, or you don't have a specific recollection of that? I don't. I don't. But I know I didn't have work. We can say Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday? Tuesday sounds fine. Um, yeah, so tell me what you noticed. She got up at, at 9 o'clock in the morning. You were so tired, weren't you? And she went to bed when? Uh, the night before that? 7 o'clock. Okay. So she got up at 0 9 after going to bed at 7. Mm -hmm. And it just reminded me of when she was 6 months old. It, was, it seemed consistent. Then she would eat like crazy, and then she would doze off again, like she was ready for bed immediately after eating. So, uh, so I just, okay, it's consistent with the other children and with her six-month-old growth spurt. So I put her down, and she'd sleep for about three hours, get up again, eat, and it seemed like she wanted to go to bed, but I, I kept her up, and she hung out and was interactive, smiling. Um, but then she'd start to fuss because she wanted to go back to bed. She was very tired, and she only likes to sleep in her bed. She or she'll sleep in the car or mm -hmm. the truck. But so so um, three days ago, 
did things happen enough that we could establish the routine? Was she on a three-day routine? Could, like, we just established two different routines that she was on. Mm -hmm. Did she have a routine the last three days? Or no, it was very, it was a bit erratic. Okay. She would, I would try and keep her up just because I was worried that she was sleeping so much. Mm -hmm. But um, when she wanted to sleep, she wanted to sleep. Was she eating? Yes, very well. And, uh, I mean, the Sunday before last, we went to Golden Corral, and she just feasted. She really liked the marshmallow sweet potatoes. Giving unnecessary details was a way to fill up the silence and to convince the other person about what one's saying. So, Tatiana definitely seems to be lying in this segment. Not only psychology, but the autopsy report of Mary also proved that. And so, at this, at this nine-month growth spurt, what, how, how much were you guessing her at then? Maybe 20. Okay. And when was the last time that you thought she was 20 pounds? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. There is a clear difference between weighing 20 pounds and weighing 8 pounds. With eyes sunken into the skull, ribs showing through her skin, and a shriveled up body, no child that looked like that could weigh 20 pounds, and Tatiana knew this. She rarely met the lead interrogator's eye while answering this direct question. So yesterday morning, when you got her up at 7, she had stood up? No, this morning. Oh, this morning. At 9, when I got her up, when I tried to get her up. Yeah. I thought maybe she, she choked on, on her spit, and that's why she, that's why. What color was her spit up? Um, it was foamy and, and brown. So I thought maybe it was the, the oatmeal and the fruit mixed in there. So where was the spit up at? Um, the side of her mouth, up, um, um, the side of her face. And was that, did you think, and I don't know, was that food? Was it blood? No, it wasn't blood. It was not blood? No, was she have any kind of vomiting of blood or anything like that? No, never. Okay. We would have taken to a doctor if well, sure. that yeah. ever happened. So you were, you were certain it was food? Yes. Essentially. And it was on her side, it was on what side of her face? Her right side. Her right side, okay. And then that's when you noticed that she was unresponsive. It was yeah. this morning when you saw that. And what what happened next? Uh, I, uh, I, um, excuse me, um, her eyes were open. Did anything look else look strange other than obviously just stood up and then her eyes were open? Or did other than that did she look as usual? She's just cold. Okay. So I went in to the to just to um, get Seth. And I told him, it's an it's an emergency and he's like and I was just so shocked and he reminded me I knew CPR and he told me to start. So I took her from the bed and I put her on her changing table and um I, I started CPR and I did the the two finger touch on the chest. Just cause if you use your whole hand, you could break ribs, and I just didn't want to do that that's for sure. I know this is tough. She smiled and chuckled a bit before starting to cry, probably realizing her mistake. I I started CPR and I did the the two finger touch on the chest. Just cause if you use your whole hand, you could break ribs, and I just didn't want to do that that's for sure. I know this is tough. So I did a two finger touch on the chest and her back, and I um, wiped her mouth, and I did. Um, so you did this on her table, on the kitchen table? No, the changing table. On oh, the changing table, in the bedroom. Yes. So you said you did it on her mouth, and then you wiped her mouth. I wiped her mouth first because it was the, the, the spit up. And okay. now that I think about it, I think it was banana and oatmeal. You know when banana's been sitting out and it's very ripe? Oh, yeah. It gets that like brownish color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but ripe banana is very sweet, and she eats the oatmeal better with it. So what did you wipe her mouth with? A baby wipe, a okay. lavender scented baby wipe. Okay, and then you did what with that? I threw it in the garbage. Okay. Well, not immediately, no, I just no. wiped her and put it to the side. Just wiped her and threw it down, yeah. Right next on the changing table. And then you picked her up out of the bed? Uh, yes, and then I put her on the changing table, and then um, when I was pumping her chest, there was like bubbles, like mm -hmm. bubbles coming out of her mouth. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I thought maybe that, that's why I thought she choked. 
And then maybe if I kept pumping, like it would, like maybe it would come out, and then she'd like cough and wake up. So I just kept wiping the bubbles, and I was giving her air and giving her um, pumping with my feet, which is my two fingers. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should have done more. Nope, you were doing it right. And she was still so cold, and and I think maybe ten, ten minutes. I don't. It's so hard to gauge time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But the experts claimed that Mary had been dead for at least 72 hours, if not more, before Seth called 911. When you say that you saw her moving, how did you see her move? Can you describe that? She was laying on her back still. Um, her blanket wasn't kicked off, and I only wrapped it right around the knees down to her feet to keep her feet warm. Um, and she had her polar bear, but she likes to play with her polar bear before she goes to bed, so she kicked it off to the side. Um, she was laying on her back. Her head was turned to the left side of it. So when I um, pushed the door open, she jerked her arm a little and turned her head. So I could see that her eyes were still closed. She was squinting a bit. Like, what was that? And then, it's okay. And that's what, that's what she does. These kinds of animated reactions might seem truthful because they were so detailed and specific. But that was where the manipulation was exposed. These gestures were truthful in a casual setting. A grieving mother would not be able to muster up enough strength to mimic her child's last moments in such a way. And the interrogators did catch on. Tatiana, we're all parents in this room, okay? And we, and we all need to be honest. You remember in, in the car when I first talked with you and I told you that at the end of the day, we all need to know exactly. Okay, so we need to tell her story, okay? And I want you to think about this for a minute. I want you to think for a second and put yourself in our shoes. You're the police officer. You're the police detective. You get called out to that home today. You get called to my home or his home today, okay? You're the police officer. And then you have to go into that house and you have to look at that, that precious little angel Okay. Do you think she was healthy, honestly? When you look at her size, and you can see every single bone in her body, do you think she was healthy? We know this is an easy Tatiana, but we need to know what happened to her. What was going on? Well, when did she start losing all that weight? For the past two days. She, she, she's lost so much weight that you can't lose that much in two days. She, I've never seen a child. The interrogator was directly looking into her eyes with a very powerful and emotionally engaging body language. He was trying to appeal to Tatiana's motherly instincts. That skinny. Really? Never. And here's the thing. You're obviously a very concerned mom, but at what point, at what point did you know, what, what, what point did you think something was wrong? Because I know that you knew something, or you thought something was wrong. You are an intelligent, educated woman. And at some point, you felt something was wrong. So when, at what point did she, she, she can't even weigh eight pounds right now. She doesn't weigh eight pounds. When's the last time that you actually inspected her, that you looked at her? Tell me the truth. Every time when I change her, and I think I just may have been just, just so blinded. And I just, what were you she, blinded by? Because I know, you listen, you are an intelligent, articulate, college-educated, early childhood development. You know. You know when you look at someone that something's wrong. I have a picture of her right here. I'm prepared to show you that tells you no medical treatment, 
as dumb as I am. I'm not near as intelligent as you. I can't speak the words you can speak. I am not you. And even I can look at this photo and I can say, whoa, something's wrong. It put tears in our eyes when we walked in there. It was that obvious. Tatiana, I'm going to be quite honest with you right now, okay? One parent to another, right? And I'm going to try and control my emotions, all right? I've been to a child death investigator school, and I've seen photos and images of children that have been malnourished. And I'm telling you right now, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. Oh, no, really? Yes. Now, before we reach the end of Tatiana's interrogation, let us see what Seth had to say. Uh, I'm not a big fan of a lot of the immunization stuff, and so I kind of balked against that, and they didn't like that either. Um, you know, they even got to the point where they, um, the first time we changed doctors, they called CPS on us just for changing doctors, because the doctor we were seeing was all the way in Byron Center from Cedar Springs. So they called CPS on us because we changed doctors and didn't give them enough notice. Or they didn't give who enough notice. I'm done with medical stuff. Seth believed in survival of the fittest. He never got any of his kids vaccinated because he believed that the weak should die and the strong must live. Like exactly the same? Mm -hmm. Wow, what's the add to that? Yeah, and she was even earlier too. That's why I just didn't, it never, you know, bothered me too much that she was skinny because she was, she came out. Yeah, yeah. From here, notice how concerning everything about this man's body language was. He was not only remorseless, but also in a calm and even fun mood, to say the least. It was now time to ask the important questions, but the interrogators were aware how sensitive that moment was, so they had to frame and ask the questions mindfully, because Seth was already prepared. So, at, at what point um, did you guys become concerned about her weight? Um, okay, so... It's always kind of it's it's always kind of been there. It's always been something that we've watched. Um, however, it never I'll say it never seemed to cause because it never it never did. Um, but I just know you guys are watching my words, so um, <laughs> it never caused her. Let's put it this way: she never was sickly in any way, mm -hmm. slow, lethargic. Um, no, no, no health indicators right. that said anything was wrong, other than that she was skinny. Which I just, I, re, I didn't, I, I just didn't let it get to me um, because, like I said, very skinny. Um, she started putting on weight recently. We really started really, you know, pounding the uh, the solid food down in the last like month or so. So, so a month or two ago, you two became concerned and started putting some proteins to her, some chickens and cheeses and whatever, just just trying to bulk her up a little mm -hmm. bit. And, and did you believe it was starting to work? I seemed to definitely notice that she was getting heavier. Um, Tatiana mentioned it to me. My mom mentioned it to me, so I would say yes. Seth was talking like he hadn't just lost his daughter. He seemed to be at peace and appeared to be talking to the officers like they were buddies. Besides that, on top of the medical negligence, the fact that Seth and Tatiana used to leave Mary sleeping for hours at a stretch was deeply distressing. Although babies do sleep longer, they need to be fed at regular intervals. Where she was, she had been sleeping for 15, 16 hours straight, and, you know, Tati just went and woke her up, and she woke right up. Oh, look who's a hungry baby, kind of thing, you know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. so, so today when it happened, I didn't really think anything all that differently. I just thought it was, oh, another sleepy baby, you know, she was... Especially, you know, my wife, like, keeps her up all morning, so she's just exhausted sometimes by the time she goes to bed. And, you know, if, if, she, doesn't, if she doesn't make a peep, if she doesn't make a sound, or if she's, if she's in there and, you know, everything, as far as I know, everything is fine when she's put down, I mean, I'm not inclined to wake the kid up. There was never a time where I thought there was something really wrong. Um, I did say to Tatiana, you know, hey, um, you know, with her being the age she is, Let's really try to see if, like, the protein, um, the, the fat and the protein it, as her digestive system is developed, let's see if that kicks things into gear, and if not, you know, let's go see a doctor. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, she's, she's a skinny little girl. When did you have that conversation? I don't know, two weeks ago. Yeah, because even at that point, I was just a little, yeah, but, you know. You, how's it going to hurt? 
So how much, uh, two weeks ago, how much did you figure that she weighed? I don't know. Why well, was she the same size now, smaller, bigger? I don't know. Okay. We can assume that Seth was overly confident about his legal counsel and believed that he was going to go back home without any issues. He seemed to think that the officers were buying his stories. I'm just confirming what you said. It looks weird. You know, is that, is, is that's all. We're not like, saying that you did something horrible in those two hours. We're just saying that, you, you know, it's not the, it's not the norm. So. Sure. Um, so what did you guys do during the two hours? We sat there and cried. Yeah. Tuck Anna called it her job. Yeah. We knew guests were coming. Did you clean anything up? Yeah, we cleaned up the house a little bit. Um, Why was that? This is a mess. Uh, I knew we were going to have my parents over. <laughs> um, so, um, I'm getting after It just did not sit right with anyone whenever Seth laughed during his interrogation. Everyone has a different coping mechanism, but laughing at his own daughter's death hardly seemed like coping. It directly highlighted how detached he was from her, and probably all his other kids, too. In the next 10 seconds, you'll see the first moment in his entire interrogation where he looked flustered and at a loss for words. Was that never an alarm for you? Was it never an alarm? Like, man, she's not where she needs to be. This is, I mean, I can see all of her bones. Mm -hmm. Well, what I just told you is, what I just told you in regards to that matter, um, I, um, so, yes, there was, which is what I told you. I also generally, um, I don't, um, I don't trust the medical system so much as other people. So when it says, oh, it, it needs to be this, this, the other, like I said, you know, I had a doctor too. Um, but looking at your daughter, looking back, you as a parent, as a father, didn't you have any concern for her looking at her? Yes, I did. But you just didn't think it was concern that the medical field could fix? One, uh, I would say somewhat. Two, uh, I'm, I was kind of more in that I have never encountered a health problem where basically if you don't do the right things and be patient, that it works itself out, um, especially with the kids. Um, I get as we get older, there's, there's other things. Um, I was not happy about how thin she was, but I also, I also, you know, have the belief that, um, you know, God didn't make us all, you know. The same. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of chalked it up to that. I was not, I was not happy about how skinny she was. You just like, if you look in the house, um, you can see all the baby food that's potatoes with chicken and cheese and all, all everything matches up with what I'm saying. Um, Did your she was always very healthy. She was never sick. She answered that way. So. Yeah, so it, so it never, if she had been sickly in any way, it, it would have been, okay, that's it. She's sickly and skinny, but she was always just skinny. But, but Seth, that, that's where I'm going to disagree with you, okay? I, I'm a parent. I'm a father. I have three children. Mm -hmm. He's a father. You're a father, mm -hmm. okay? And I'm just being honest with you, okay? Because I don't know how to be anything other than, okay? And I'm telling you right now, I've been doing this job for a long time, okay? And he'll tell you when I walked in that bedroom today, all right, I started crying, okay? I looked at that little baby, and I looked at her for a millisecond, mm -hmm. and I knew that she wasn't right. And I knew that she wasn't right for some time, okay? And you're her father. Yep. And I'll tell you, I, I saw her when she was dead, too. Just, she, was very, she was much more gaunt when she was dead than she ever was when she was alive. I mean, I got, I got pictures on my phone. I, I, I'm... Yeah. Right, but, but when, let me ask you this. When's the last time you saw that baby without any clothes on in a bath? Me? I, I've, never, I've never given her a bath. Okay, when, what, so, but you, you changed her diaper mm -hmm. maybe a day, day and a half mm -hmm. ago, correct? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm not putting words in your mouth. You said that, correct? Mm -hmm. How did you not, when you looked at her a day and a half ago changing her diaper and realize that my daughter is skin and bone? When I looked at her belly in the house, okay, and I'm not exaggerating this. Oh, I know. I could see the outline. 
of her intestines through her stomach. I could see her spine completely through her back. I could see every one of her ribs through her chest. Yeah, I, like I said, I mean, like I, uh, like I said, I'm not happy about it either. Um, you know, you're welcome to go through my garbage and look at the baby food containers. Yeah. Even in the face of direct confrontation, there wasn't a lot that changed in Seth's body language. He was confused for a while, but he continued to use his overconfident and cool tone with the detectives. So, the interrogators had to put more pressure on him. The conversation was getting increasingly confrontational, but Seth didn't budge. Looking back, was, was it a week ago? Was it two weeks ago? Was it three weeks ago? Was it a month ago? When, when would you have done something different? When you, I mean, you, you know, this didn't happen overnight. She didn't get this malnourished and skinny overnight, okay? This is a, a, a lengthy process, mm -hmm. okay? And this has been going on for some time. That's what I'm asking. At what point, you knowing what you know today, if you could go back and reset the clock to try to prevent today, how far back do you think you would go? Um, I don't know because I, I, I can't tell you. Um, you know, maybe, maybe the first mention somebody had that I respected that she was too skinny. That she was too How thin. long ago was that? I don't know. Like I said, she's been skinny since she was born. So, today, at what point today? Did you and or Tatiana think this doesn't look good? The size of her, all that, this doesn't look good. Today? Yeah. Well, we didn't, we kind of like woke up and she was dead, so. No, but I mean after that, when you were thinking that this is like, for, as far as it doesn't look good that, that we didn't get her the medical treatment or whatever. What, at what point today did you think that? Um, I don't know. I guess I haven't, I, I guess I haven't really worried about it too much. His daughter was dead, but he was not worried about it too much. It was a disregard that Seth showed towards Mary that really underlined the reasons why he was so unaffected. Let me ask you a, a, an honest, just an honest answer. Do you, re, do you feel responsible in any way for what happened today? I feel like that's a bit of a trap question, but um, no, I, 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 or do you just say honest, or do you think it's just God's will? Well, just because it might be God's will doesn't mean that there's not some that it's not His will according to our actions, or it doesn't mean that we're not responsible in some way for what has come about. And so, do I? I take responsibility on myself for anything that goes wrong in my life at all, even if it's totally not my fault. I still, what could I have done? Um. Now coming back to Tatiana's interrogation, it might have been possible that she was genuinely surprised, but getting an education in childhood development, being a mom to two kids already, it was hard to believe that she did not know what was up. But it was likely that the truth and severity of the situation was finally settling in. Now, we'll play a large segment of the interrogation that was very important to the case. You, you clearly need help too, though. You're going to okay. be dealing with this, this is baggage, this is something that... But all I want to know is what stopped you from seeking help? You knew something was wrong. What stopped you? Tell us the truth. I mean, are you guys that financially strapped? I mean, what is it? Do you not believe in health care? Do you, I mean, do you have religious beliefs? I mean, what is it? We do have religious beliefs, and I, we just we were praying about it, and, and we have faith that, that. When did you start praying about it? I mean, when she was born, but consistently and, and heavily the past three, three, four days. So three, four days ago, you started praying. What were your prayers? Eating wise and it's sticking. Like why? Like I, 
she ate so much, like. But so why? Why? I it stick. I have a strong faith as well, a very strong faith, and I think God answers prayers. I'm with you on that. I also think God puts people in places to help people, but we all have our own beliefs. But here's what I'm saying: is that you, you guys knew enough was wrong to start heavily and consistently praying. Why didn't we seek help? You knew. I just didn't. No, no, no. Say anything to Seth? I... Seth had to know. He doesn't ever hold her. Yes, but he was also very um, faithful and, and trust in God and, and trust that, that that it would be okay and didn't think we needed to bring her to a doctor. We knew. How, how long did you know this? What the condition? It doesn't happen in three days. It doesn't happen in four days. I think I, I just deluded myself. I just didn't want to believe that. So when did you delude yourself? When did you start? When did this condition start? I think within a month it started to become a little bit up and down. Her cheeks would be full and and bright, and and then a couple of days later she would she would look ill or hungry, and then we're not hungry, just just her cheeks wouldn't be as full as they were. Sunken then. Yeah, and then. So when did you notice that she had other bones showing? About a month. About well, a month ago. Well, let, let me ask you this: When was the last time you bathed her? Oh, um, maybe two weeks ago. So about a month ago, you you notice that her bones are all showing, right? And so, is that when you started happily praying? No, it was it was the past few days because uh, about a month ago it would be like full, and then you know two days later it'd be sunken in, but then within the day it'd be full again. But then the past few days it wouldn't fill up as quickly as as it used as it did. But listen, here's what I'm saying, Mary. Listen. I get that, but her legs were as small as my pointer finger. So you that that didn't happen in three days. No. And I know that you know that, and I know that you wanted to get her help, but I'm trying to just figure out when did this happen. I understand that maybe you started seeing some kind of symptoms a month ago, but when when did she consistently? lose all of this weight? When did she consistently become skin and bones? I think it was within the month. Cause so, she, she was always just so so thin. and So within a month, so then why, when we had a month to look at her like this, why, why didn't we get help? Tatiana could not be as oblivious as she was claiming to be. She hadn't fed her child for days, so there was no doubt that she knew what was happening to her. We thought, we thought she'd get better without getting help. How did you think she was going to get better? By feeding her and, and, and being with her. Was she really truly eating the way that you were telling us? Yes. I, Be, I because, it, you know, if, if you want, he has a photo of her, and if you want to see it, I mean, she, I'm pretty sure that I explained this to both you and Seth when you were in my car with me. Um, you know, she's there's going to be an autopsy done, okay? And there was a medical uh, a person from the medical examiner's office at the house, okay? So we're going to know all this what we're saying. Yeah. But, and, and you're not you're not a bad person. We get all this, and we get that there's there's a dynamic here that we're trying to figure out. There is a dynamic here, and I'm going to tell you, I, I know it. I can. I know there's a dynamic, and I feel that you wanted to get her help. I'm trying to just figure out why you didn't. What's the dynamic? What am I missing? Because you can't tell me that this Brooklyn, New York, this New York College, City College, Educated Grand Rapids Community College, Early Childhood person didn't know that this girl needed help, but something stopped her. I just am trying to figure out what it is. What stood between you and help? I think that I was just... I think I was worried about another CPS call from the doctors, and I thought that um, Mary would get better and it would be okay. But 
but at what point did you get better? So two, three days ago, you thought she wasn't going to get better. So then why didn't we call then? What? Recently, it just became a little thought in my head that maybe we should. And then I was worried about CPS and about, about just losing faith. Because we've had issues with CPS before, and I just didn't want to lose this kid. So you, you, thought, you, thought you, lo you thought you were losing faith by thinking you needed to go to the doctor? But yeah, that I wasn't having faith in God to fix this. Mm-hmm. Stupid about it now. So, so um, that's what we're that's that's what we're trying to figure out. Do you think? And I'm not ridiculing this. I just want to know. Do you guys think that that God doesn't want us to use doctors? No. So you, do you think God puts people in places to help us? Yes, I do. I believe that for sure. And you think doctors could be those people? Yeah. So. All still, I, I I get what you're saying, but but this is what I'm telling you. Two days ago, I could have looked at this child and I could have said this child has hours to live. Here's when the interrogation began coming to fruition. Tatiana would say something that would be used in the trial against her. So, but you didn't you didn't receive the help, and you knew that two days ago you knew you just said that you that she was probably. What did you say? Beyond help, or whatever it was two days ago. So what? It's not beyond help. I just... At what point? At what point in this illness did you think there's a good chance she's gonna die? I didn't think at all that she was gonna die. I, I just... How could you not think that? Delusional. I, just... I don't have a reason why I couldn't think that. I was just being such a hopeful mom. I suppose I I don't have a good reason for you. I'm sorry. What was your conversations like with Seth? You said a minute ago that you knew that he didn't want to go to a doctor. Yeah, because well, we discussed it before. That we just Dis discussed her conditions. Yes. When was the first time you guys discussed that? Maybe a month ago. So a month ago is when. What did you notice a month ago? Because I'm I'm certain you're the one. Because you said that you know Seth didn't want to go. So obviously you're the one that brought up needing to go to the doctor. What did you notice a month ago? That she was almost nine months old and just wasn't filling into her clothing like she should. And, and you know, we talked about it and you just, just have faith and just we'll keep feeding her like we do and keep nursing her and keep her active and she'll get there. It's okay, she'll get there. But... Let me ask you something. If Seth told you that God told him to sacrifice one of your children, would you do it? No. That's what I'm saying, though. I'm, that's what I'm trying to wrap my head around. How many conversations did you have with Seth about this? Would he get angry talking about it? No, I think he'd be very sure. What would happen? What would he? How would he react if you took him to the took her to the doctor anyway? I'm not sure. It, something like that has never happened. Um, I'm just asking to speculate. I think he would just be concerned that CPS would be called. This would make the base for prosecution's arguments against Tatiana and Seth. The motive for neglect was made a little bit clear. They were afraid that CPS would be called on them. Now the detectives were trying to get a straight-up confession, but they knew it was not going to be easy. So they tried giving her an alternative highlighting Seth's role in the neglect. Did he ever even make a comment about her body? You guys looked at her and he never said anything about it? You know how he described her to us on the phone? I can you can listen to the nine one one. He described her as nope, she's dead as a doornail. He gets he gets like that when he's very very upset. He's just just distraught, and he, 
I cry, and yeah, he cries, but he tries to be strong for everyone. Tatiana did not want to hold on to that saving grace just yet. However, she did accuse Seth of violence and assault, and she blamed him for everything during her trial in 2021. In the next clip, the last sentence would sum up the reason for all this carelessness. No, no, nobody, Tatiana, for, for one second, I don't want you to think that anybody is trying to say that you didn't love your child. No. Okay? But I am going to be blatantly honest with you. You didn't pro provide the necessary care for your daughter. You, you didn't. Do you think you did? And we're just trying to figure out why. Do, do you think you did right? But what stopped you? Tr truly, what stopped you? From what? Fr from, get from getting her help a month ago. Was it embarrassment? Was it fear? Was it... I, I mean, think, what was it? I think it was it was fear of PPS. I, I think that I just thought that I was overreacting. And it was just all in my head because I... I, I tend... I tend to to overthink things when it's not necessary, and I just thought there was another one of those. And our other two children are just so healthy, and... Or am I delusional about that, too? Uh, like, I don't know. I don't as know. far as they appear, I mean, they... What? But here's the difference, though. You just said it right there. You just said it. As far as they appear. But we know that it appeared healthy. So that it's not a delusion. It's an observation that your other two children clearly appear healthy, right? And clearly didn't. That's comparing apples and oranges. So it shows that your observations were working. You weren't delusional. You know that these two appear healthy and this one didn't. So we need to go and get this one fixed. Figure out what's wrong with her. Mm -hmm. well, let me ask you this: did, did you did you plan on having each of your children? No. No. Seth and Tatiana did not plan on having children, but ended up having them, and then treated them so miserably. There were some reports that said that they didn't feed the other kids for days, and that they had to eat dirt and grass. However, the authenticity of these reports might be questionable. After this, the interrogators already had what they needed. Then they stepped out of this interrogation room to have a conversation with Seth. Finally, Seth and Tatiana were allowed to have a couple of minutes together. Seth's going to come in here and sit with you. It's going to be a couple minutes. One of my partners is going to run you guys home for me, okay? Because he's working late already. I left so. my salad in the back of your car. I'm sorry. You left your what? My salad. It's just garbage. That's all right. You're not. You don't need it. Uh, I'll throw. I'll throw it away. It's okay. So I'll. Uh, you just a couple minutes, okay? Okay. Hi, baby. Hi. How are you doing? How are you? I'm happy that I'm with you now. Me too. Did you talk to your parents at all while you were waiting? How's what's going on? Yeah, we're Because we're such bad parents. Not even allowed to talk to them. It took so long to ask me all about kids, all three of their birth weight, height, and eating habits, and developmental skills, and early, go to your pee and poop, and then, I think that was a distraction, because right after that, I was just like, why did it take you so long to call, I just kept berating with that, it wouldn't even let me answer, so you saw the what? to call the police after, oh, uh -huh. Out. 
I told you like six times. I was waiting for the lawyer to be there because we knew that this would happen. Oops, I told them we were waiting for. We did see your parents, but I sent lawyers. And we were just. Then what'd you do while you were waiting? I called off work. I. We slept. And I sat and cried. Uh, and let's do this, baby. You know, their job is to fill cells. It's their job. So, they can fill two cells right now. And I'm that's... asking me if you were angry. Like, it sounded like they were trying... I don't know if this is movie mind, but, like, separate us. So they're done. They're, they're trying to make you seem a lot more like a prisoner than you really are. Right now, you're here, under your own, you're here under your own compulsion and I'm not sure. Yeah. There's really not much they can do if we wanted to walk out right now. We're doing this as a show. And not even for them, but for probably when we have to go up in front of a judge. is all they want. They want to charge. They want somebody. There's got to be money involved. There's got to be a financial transaction. So it's like you can't, you can't go just bury a dead body. You gotta, you gotta pay somebody. There's gotta. Be. It was a junk full of growth hormones and steroids. I mean, I'm sorry, you know. I don't want to, you think I'm happy about it? These are authentic. Yeah, they were kind of like pushing me about a whole doctor thing. I was like, you know what the number one leading cause of death in this country is? Kind of stopped. Dude, put me on trial. I'll put the whole system on. I'll put the whole system on trial. Put me on trial. You know what you're fucking with? Yeah, they try. They try to work the religious extremist angle with me too. Super. They're looking for somebody to say something crazy. They're looking for the crazy. That's what they're looking for. Yeah. They're looking for their way in. It is actually spine-chilling to see them both talk so casually. During this conversation, one of the interrogators came in to ask for Tatiana's consent to take her phone. And this is how they decided to make fun of him. Just, just here to help. <laughs> Not only that, they talked about their dead daughter Mary, too. No, I'm not trying to get it. I'm just saying that's why. That's one of the reasons why I have such a bad picture of her. Dude, she looked so bad. On the phone and the dates and stuff. And, and they won't know this. Yeah, right. They believe what they saw. They showed me a picture of her. And it didn't look real. I mean, she was dead overnight, and then she was sitting there all day dead, and then they're going to... Take that? Of course. I mean, there's room at like 80 degrees. Of course. Cook ya.
In August 2018, the couple faced initial charges of felony murder related to homicide. The video capturing their reaction to the charges gained significant attention online. In June 2020, Seth Welch was found guilty of first-degree murder and received a life sentence in prison with no chance of parole. Later in 2021, Tatiana testified against Seth describing domestic violence that was common at their home. She was seen crying, but everyone had one question in mind. Why now? Although breaking free from a toxic relationship is hard, no parent could watch their child die a painful death. Mary did not die because of an accident or even one moment of cruelty. She died hungry and thirsty due to a lifetime of neglect. There were many ways by which both Seth and Tatiana could have kept Mary alive, and the simplest option that they had was just to feed her. She claimed that Seth was abusive and cruel and did not allow Mary to be taken to a doctor, but Tatiana could have easily nursed Mary, kept her surroundings clean, checked on her, and just done the bare minimum of what a mother is supposed to do. But she chose not to do that. Therefore, in November 2021, Tatiana received a sentence of life without the possibility of parole for first-degree murder. She also received an additional sentence of 15 to 30 years for the charge of first-degree child abuse. It is true that Mary died, but if there is any silver lining in this, it is that she gave life to her siblings, who were taken away from the neglected home they were growing up in. But why did she have to die? Why should a young life be sacrificed for adults to realize their responsibilities? And why do these people keep on having babies if they do not want to care for them? We might never know the answers to these questions, but we know that justice was served. It is a bittersweet moment because even though Seth and Tatiana are behind bars, an innocent life is forever lost. Broken Air 911. Hello? I want my dad to be attacking my family. Your dad is attacking your family? No, my dad will. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I, I, um, I think I had to stay at home. You stayed at home? I think, yeah, I got when she was walking away, I think I had to go for the night, but, you know. Is that when you cut yourself? Yeah, yeah I think I'd have to do that. Where did you stab her? I just had to go from behind and cut her whole body. Did you cut her? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah. I would call him back when James Egan Holmes. James Egan Holmes is a guy that shot up the theater. In Colorado? Yeah, he killed 12. And, uh, wow. How many were killed in Columbine? Columbine? I don't know, like 15. Okay. I think. Did you guys have a goal? Did you have a number? He just wanted. I think he wanted to kill like 50. Okay. I mean, I he just wanted to be famous. What did you want? Me? Mm -hmm. You keep talking about what he wanted. What did you want? Yes. Teen coverage this evening. One of the brothers accused of murdering his five family members in Broken Arrow. Five Arrow. members of a Broken Arrow family murdered. One member of the family, a 12 year old girl, survived and identified her brothers as the killers. This is a YouTube video of the Beaver Brothers filmed in 2013, a stark contrast from the previous clip. This is a fun-filled video of two teenage brothers trying out their way to be creative and famous. The eldest of the seven siblings, Robert and Michael, were pretty close. The family lived at 709 Magnolia Court, Oklahoma. However, in the present day, their house doesn't exist anymore. There is a reflection park in the same location. The tragedy behind turning this home into a reflective park is heart-wrenching. A home where sweet laughters and giggles that echoed were silenced forever. A crime was committed that questioned the boundaries of human behavior. Before we proceed, a little heads up. This video contains intense topics and unsettling psychological elements of the human mind. Viewer discretion is advised. Your well-being and mental health are the top priority. At 11.30 p.m. of July 22, 2015, Broken Arrow police received a call from a 12-year-old named Daniel Beaver, reporting a family attack at a house on East Magnolia Court. Broken Arrow 911. Hello? Hi. Hi, where are you at? Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, 7411. What address? 
Seven and I'm in the Seven, okay. Are you the only one there? No. My brother's attacking my family. Your dad is attacking your family? No, my dad will. Oh, he has an idea. He's killing me. Oh, please, he's killing me and take people out. Okay, who's attacking your family? What? Who's attacking your family? Yes. Who, who is it? Do they have I'll call them. No, I'm Are you there? Hello? These were Daniel's last words, as just after the call, he was stabbed 21 times by his elder brother, Michael. Upon arrival, they discovered 13-year-old Crystal with multiple stab wounds, who identified her brothers, Robert and Michael, as the killers. Tragically, five members of the Beaver family, including the father, mother, and three siblings, were found deceased. The youngest sibling, two years old, Autumn, was found unharmed sleeping in her crib. Michael Beaver, aged 16, and Robert Beaver, aged 18, were discovered hiding in a wooded area behind their family's residence, allegedly covered in dirt and blood. Both were subsequently arrested post-midnight by K-9. Both were taken under custody facing charges of five counts of first-degree murder and one count of assault and battery with a deadly weapon. The following interrogation is of Michael Beaver, who explained all the unanswered questions. Questions about the intricacies of the crime, its gruesome nature, and most importantly, the reason behind killing their own family. Can you still read some stuff to you that makes it legal for us to talk to you, okay? Um, so like I told you when I met you at the jail, my name's Eric. I'm a detective here with Broken Heart Police. Like she told you, her name's Rihanna. She's a detective also. Um, and uh, we just want to spend some time and maybe talk and discuss some things. and. Maybe ask you some questions, let you ask us some questions, and make sure we're all comfortable with what's going on, and then we'll go from there. That sounds good. Okay. In Michael's interrogation, his demeanor appears notably anxious and fatigued, with visible signs of nervousness in both his facial expressions and body language. This suggests that he may be experiencing significant stress or discomfort during the questioning. Considering Michael's age and also the gravity of the crime, Detective Eric Bentz adopts a reassuring and persuasive tone to make himself more approachable towards Michael. However, the subtle assertiveness in his body language also sets the intention of the interrogation clear to Michael. Okay, so you've probably heard or seen this on TV before, but it's your notification of rights, your Miranda rights. And so I'm going to read it to you, but I want to sit here where you can see the paper, because I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read one through five right here. And so I'll read them, and you kind of can look at it with me. I want to make sure you understand all these. Um, you have the right to remain silent. You do not have to answer any questions or make any statement. Anything you say can be used against you in court. You have the right to talk to a lawyer before we ask you any questions. And you have the right to have a lawyer with you during questioning. If you cannot afford a lawyer and want one, the court will appoint one for you before you are asked any questions. It's hard to read it sideways. Um, if you want to answer questions now without a lawyer being present, you may do so. You have the right to stop answering questions at any time. So you understand what those are saying? Basically, if you want an attorney, just tell me. Um, if you don't like any of the questions I ask, just tell me to stop. Um, if you get uncomfortable, we'll stop whenever you want. Kind of you're in control. Does that sound good? Okay. Um, so what I want to do is I'm going to read this waiver to you right here, yeah. and you look at it as I read it to you, because I'll make sure you understand it. Um, <clears throat> it says, I have read the statement of my rights shown above. I understand what my rights are. I'm willing to answer questions and make a statement. I do not want a lawyer present at this time. I understand and know what I am doing. No promises or threats have been made to me, and no pressure of any kind has been used against me. So if you agree with that statement that I just read to you, that you're looking at, if you'll sign right there for me. I don't know how well I can do my signature. Yeah, just whatever you can do the best. Okay, that's all we need. So you put high school for your formal education, yep. and are you presently on any drugs or medication? You answered no. Are you under the influence of alcohol? You answered no. And you do read and speak English, obviously, you put yes. Yeah. Sound good? Okay. Um, do you take any prescription medications?
As Detective Bentz reads out Michael's rights with patience, Michael responds with frequent head nods and direct eye contacts, suggesting that he wants to actively engage and cooperate throughout the interrogation. He decided to cooperate because he was already aware that the police knew he was directly involved in the crime. Well, man, I'm, you know, I'm just kind of got thrown into this, so I was hoping maybe you could kind of just go back at the beginning when all this started and kind of tell me what happened, because I need... I need kind of the details so we know and understand what, what you went through and stuff. Okay, so I'm the very start. Mm-hmm. Okay, about like uh, two months ago. Okay. Is when we first uh, really started talking. So when you say we, who are you talking about? Me and my brother, who is also. Your was, brother? Yeah, who is he has to do with me? And what's his name? Uh, Robert Beverly. Robert? Okay, and how old is he? Uh, 18. Okay, all right, go ahead, sorry. Uh, a couple months ago, I think it back to the start of this year, we started talking about uh, Boohoo and Rampage and stuff like that. Okay. And I didn't take it seriously at first, but then he started buying like a body armor and stuff. Where did he buy body armor from? eBay and Amazon. Oh, okay. Yeah, legal. Does yeah. he have a job? He did at my tech, he quit the start of the year. Um, and uh, basically, it just kept escalating, he kept getting burned, and he asked if I went in, and I said yes, so he got me my own set. Okay. And then, about a month, about like June 30th, is when he came to me and said he found out that he can legally buy guns without permit in Oklahoma, that he could. Okay. And uh, that's when he started planning. Michael's response to the first question related to the crime, marked by a deep sigh, suggests a degree of emotional weight or hesitation. As Michael continues to describe the planning of the crime, there is a noticeable shift in his voice and posture. His voice becomes clearer, and there is a hint of passion which suggests that he is becoming more emotionally invested or engaged in sharing the details of the planning. Okay. There's something, and um, then he bought, I think it was like 250 shotgun rounds okay. on eBay. Not eBay, but on some, on some website. And then I think he bought close to 1,000 rounds for the box. Wow, okay. And, uh, but he's still. Oh, so he was supposed to have to take those up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was supposed to come up today. Um. While Michael informs detectives the details of the weapons and the ammunition that Robert bought, Detective Bentz gives a surprising expression with the word wow. This expression may genuinely reflect his astonishment at the amount and nature of the weapons and ammunitions discussed. It can also be a deliberate strategy to take out more information from Michael. By expressing surprise or amazement, the detective is probably attempting to create an atmosphere where Michael feels encouraged to share additional details. In this case, the response is quite spontaneous, and thus it's most likely that the detective is surprised more than strategic. So then, uh, so, so he was buying weapons because mm-hmm. you guys had talked about murdering. Yeah, and he started planning it. Okay. And I went along with it because I didn't see the other way. I thought I didn't want to do it. I quickly learned tonight that I didn't. Okay, that you didn't want to do it? I don't want to do it. I didn't, um, just because I didn't kill anyone. Okay. I stabbed someone. Who did you stab? Um, my younger brother, Christopher. Christopher? How old is Christopher? Um, nine, I think. What did you stab him with? Oh, my knife. What's your knife look like? It's green, um, kind of like camouflage, honestly, my knife. Um, where your hand goes or where the blade is? It's camouflage? Yeah, it's all camouflage. Oh, the whole thing? Yeah. How big is it? Show me how big it is. I think it's about this big. Okay. Handable. What so what was, what was Christopher doing when you stabbed him? He was laying on the bathroom floor. Robert was also stabbing him. Robert asked him to go over and help him. So I stabbed Christopher and then... Where did you stab him? Oh, stabbed him the neck. Really? Okay. You okay? Yeah. You okay? Let me know if you need a break or anything, okay? I'm good. Um, so, was Christopher still alive when you stabbed him? Yes. What was he saying and doing? He was just screaming. Screaming. Was, did you say he was in the bathroom? Yeah, I was next to the toilet. Um, Michael in this section admits his direct involvement in the crime by confirming that he stabbed Christopher, one of the victims. This confession is a significant development in the interrogation. Although Michael's statement that he didn't mean to kill Christopher suggests a complex emotional response such as remorse or regret for his actions, his actions need to be considered. Additionally, Michael looks visibly uncomfortable while explaining the details of how he stabbed Christopher. 
It suggests that saying these details out loud may be emotionally distressing for him, and he may be struggling to confront the reality of his actions. So you know, why did he want to do it? Do it? Kill people? Yeah. Um, well, t- mainly two reasons, I think. It's um, because he just, like, he says he hates everyone he thinks society is pointless, and so okay. he wanted to kill people. Yeah, and he also he wanted to, like, beat, um, beat the kill, like, amount of other famous people like Columbine and uh, James Egan Holmes. Okay. Did you kind of feel that way too, like when you guys were talking earlier, like, yeah. it, like, do you have a problem with society too, you think? No, no I just... Or you were just more like the, the number of people getting killed was kind of interesting and yeah, exciting. Yeah. Okay. Here, Michael initially confirms the inspiration for their violent plan to Robert's hatred for society and its insignificance. A notable contrast is evident when Michael is asked if he shares the same feelings about society as Robert. He confesses that his primary fascination was with the number of people they could kill and that he didn't have a strong concern for society. This reveals that the two brothers had their individual motivations and priorities. Michael's response offers insight into his mindset, revealing a disturbing fascination with a potential scale of violence. This may be indicative of a detached or disturbed perspective of reality, potentially tied to psychological factors. So, um, because you mentioned a couple names of, are those like serial killers or something? What, like Columbine? Yeah. Uh, Columbine and James Egan Holmes. James Egan Holmes is a guy that shot up the theater. In Colorado? Yeah, he killed 12. And, uh, wow. How many were killed in Columbine? Columbine, I don't know, like 15, okay. I think. Um, so did you guys have a goal? Did you have a number? He just wanted, I think he wanted to like 50. Okay. So how, okay, so as the planning goes, tell me, just tell me what what plans you started making and coming up with. Well, originally, I think kind of stayed steady uh, throughout the month is so we want to kill everyone at the house first. Okay. And then wait for all the packages to show up over the weekend. Um, and then we take the economy to have our state with the guns and uh, start, okay. start killing. Okay. Rampaging. Did you know where you were going to drive to? Uh, towards Washington. Washington State or DC? Washington State. Oh. Washington State. Why would you go to Washington State? Just kind of, yeah, it's kind of the direction. Michael reveals that he and Robert drew inspiration for their violent actions from the violence perpetrated by infamous serial killers like James Holmes, who killed 15 people in a Colorado theater, and the Columbine High School shooting by Eric Harris. This admission highlights their influence from real-life individuals who committed heinous crimes. It indicates a desire for notoriety or a distorted sense of being famous. There is a potential chance that their detailed planning and obsession was due to this external influence. From the interrogation that we've covered earlier, Aaron Yabara also drew his inspiration from Eric Harris. How, I mean, how long have you had these feelings? Uh, the evil feelings or the good ones? Both. Uh, since I was 13, the the good feelings, mm-hmm. until 23 when my stuff got taken away. My bedroom furniture got taken away. So in the last three years, you've started having these bad feelings? Yeah. And can you describe the bad feelings to me? I started, uh, I just felt nothing but hate, 100% hate towards the world, towards everyone. I started to mount the local bar once because uh, I just wanted everything and everyone to die and then Columbine came to mind I don't know how but it just hit me I've been when I was watching the news when I was a kid oh Columbine like Eric Harris just came into my head the mastermind of the shooting right and I kept identifying with him ever since the, the past three years because he just made everything so exciting he made hate so exciting an outright example of how this news has a negative influence on teenagers. So then kind of what happened is, I mean, you guys started getting all that stuff together and yeah. kind of throwing things away. And yeah, and we knew that all the packages and the holsters, alibis, all that stuff was going to get healthy on Amazon. And so we set a date. So was the plan um, to use the knives at first on yeah. the family? Because the guns weren't going to be here till later on? Yeah, and the guns would be too loud. Oh, I see. So, um, going to use the guys on the family, which obviously mm-hmm. did not go as planned. 
Yeah. Oh, thank God. Yeah. Um, oh, I just saw the red swords right now. Like, we didn't put more people out there. Yeah. Did, um, so then you picked a date, you said? Yeah, which was yesterday. Yesterday night was the date. Did you pick a time and everything? Yep, yeah, midnight when most of you were in bed except for mom. So how did you guys know? He just came and got you or you got him or what did you we, guys we, do? We were hanging out in the outbeds and waiting. Okay, and so... How did you pick the date? Um, we were they vaulting out with the packages and stuff we have. Because you know all the ammunition, he didn't want them to see that. So we killed him the day before the ammunition got held. The day after we move. Do you guys, um, do you guys not like your mom and dad? I mean, is there have they? I mean, I'm, most teenagers don't like their parents, so I can understand that. Yeah, I mean, mom's okay, but dad was a little bit, you know, just a little bit too much. Yes. In this section, Michael reveals that they chose the attack date based on the ammunition delivery, with Robert's motive being to hide it from their family. This suggests the distorted perspective that the brothers have about reality, and they just needed an excuse to inflict violence. Moreover, he also explains that they opted for knives over guns to minimize noise and attention. Here, notably, Michael expresses a relief that they didn't get the ammunition after all, recognizing the potential for even more widespread harm, possibly showing a hint of remorse or awareness of the gravity of their plans. My sister, um, she came in because she was going to go to bed. She came in to tell us. Um, How old was she? 13. Okay. She came in to tell us that mom wanted us to get the kitchen done before we went to bed and put the cats up. And basically, we did what we planned. I did. I, uh, I got to my desk and I like, had to look at something to this guy to roll up or went up behind her. Grabbed to him and slept with you. Really? What did he use? Um, his large red knife. Okay, a large red knife. Yeah, it's like my. How big is it? It's like my red. Oh, I see. It's that big. Um, and then she fell to the ground screaming. Mom, and Dad. You know, Mom came in first, and then. She is your room way. upstairs? Or I, I don't know. I haven't been um, here house, so I don't know. Her room is downstairs. It's towards the back. Of the okay. House. And so she fell down and started screaming. Yeah, well. Okay. Okay. I kept stabbing her, I kind of freaked out because, you know, mm -hmm. I wasn't planning on this. Were you saying anything or, I mean? I just stood there. Okay. And then mom came in yelling, called the police. And then he went over and stabbed her. Then he stabbed her? Yeah, he probably was stabbing her, pushed her, you know, foot down the hallway. And she got up and ran. Okay. She ran out the door. When, now, okay, so she sat down at your desk. And he slid her through it. Well, she was standing at my desk and oh, came up behind and slid her through it, and then she fell down screaming. And then he stabbed her some more? When he was stabbing her some more, was it, where was he stabbing her? Her neck. Oh, her neck. Her neck and her stomach. Stomach. Okay. And, um, and then my mom came in, and she started yelling, called the police, get dad. And then he came up and started attacking her. Then he actually got up and ran out the front door. Wow. And um, once mom was on the ground, he got up and started chasing after her. And what were you doing? Standing. Did you come out in the hallway? No, no, I was just standing in the room and the process on what I was doing. Michael shows visible signs of discomfort during his explanation of the first attack initiated by himself and Robert on his 13-year-old sister. Restlessness along with deep and heavy breaths suggests that recounting the details of this violent act is emotionally distressing for him. Detective Bentz, on the other hand, adopts a composed and steady demeanor throughout this time. His questioning and cross-questioning are aimed at gaining insights related to the psychological factors that drove the two brothers to commit such a heinous act. So he stabbed your mom with the same knife? Yep, same knife. And where did he stab her? I think in the neck, too. Okay. And, um, and, no, actually, he stabbed her in the neck, pushed her into the kitchen, and then stabbed her. So with you, she started screaming and ran into the family. You know, at the same time, he fell asleep. I left the house. Okay. I ran over and disabled the alarm. Okay. That's what I did. And then Where's ran, the, the pad for your alarm? It's not the front door. It's what? It's now the front door. Near the front door? Yeah. And I'm, so I went over and disabled the alarm so it wouldn't, you know. But has she already gone outside? She went outside and then Robert went after her. So where where did she... Uh, she she was laying in the driveway and he took go her back. Um, you know, the bench, you know, if you have the and start choking her. On the bench? Out front? Yeah, it was like a little bitch, and they threw the bench on her. And went back inside to go after the little kids. Did he bring her in, or did she stay out there? She stayed out there until he asked me if he didn't come in. I had to go inside, that's why she was in the, um, 
in the Ginsky way. I had to go inside. So oh, you brought her back in. Yeah, she was still alive? Screaming. Yeah, she was still screaming. And then at about the time, Dad came down. Okay. Because his bedroom's upstairs. And he went back in the police alley while Robert was, what boys say, that's what they call it, on our room. Um, and they started attacking Dad. They got a whole, little bit of a fight. Um, but then eventually, Robert got him down and um, I think he killed him. Did he cut his throat too? Michael's quick response to questions without much hesitation may suggest his eagerness to get done with this conversation as soon as possible because he was slowly getting more and more uncomfortable. Detective Bentz recognizes Michael's discomfort and employs a calm and reassuring tone in response. By adjusting his tone and demeanor, he attempts to convey understanding and empathy, emphasizing the importance of discussing the details. This approach aims to create a supportive and non-confrontational atmosphere, encouraging Michael to share more openly. Daniel was in uh, his room, which is you know, down the hall, and I was oh, like, "Let me." How old is Daniel? Oh, um, I think it's I think it's twelve. Okay. And um, I was like, "Let me in," and he let me in. They were sitting down on the phone with the police. I grabbed the phone, the one, which is my phone, got my phone, and then I went into the kitchen and I smashed the underground. So, which was your phone? Yeah, it was my phone. Oh, now you don't have a cell phone anymore. I don't. <laughs> um. And then I went back down, and he, um, and Daniel and Christopher, Christopher locked himself in the bathroom, Daniel locked himself in Dad's office. Okay. And then I finally got both of them to open the door, um, because they thought I wanted them to see. But they were in different room. rooms? Yeah, they were right next to each other. Right? Oh, I see. And then, um, Robert went in and stabbed him, and they went in and, uh, stabbed Christopher, that's, that's when I stabbed Christopher. So when he stabbed Daniel, where did he stab Daniel? I think he um, shanked him in the neck and then Daniel ran off and so he went in and started attacking Christopher. So Daniel got stabbed in the neck and ran off? Yeah. Where did he run to? He ran into the family room about mom. Mom ended up, she was lying on the ground yelling, call 911. Okay. And, and he stopped in there? Yeah, he lay, he collapsed in there and then Margo came in and started stabbing him in the chest. Oh, I see. Um. Then, and then, who's the youngest, the four-year-old? The four-year-old, I don't know what happened with her. I hope she's alive. I'm I, sorry, I, I, I messed up. The, the one that you stabbed, who, who was that? Christopher. Christopher, that's he's what I'm trying to say. He's eight. Ten. And he was in the bathroom. Yep. So Daniel had got stabbed in the neck, ran out mm -hmm. to where your mom was. Yeah. He, Robert followed him, stabbed him some more. Yeah, after, after we uh, stabbed Christopher in the bathroom. Oh, I see. Okay. And um, and then basically after that, uh, the was pretty much dead. We forgot about Robert. Who was dead? Everyone, I think. Okay. It looked like they were dead, except for she was lying in the kitchen screaming. Then there was a knock at the door. Okay. Someone knocked at the door. I think that might be the neighbor because the police wouldn't have been there yet. And then they just kept knocking on the door. So we turned around. I grabbed on. I uh, put my soft vest and heavy vest on. I was carrying the plates. I put my helmet on. And then we went, we went up the back door of Dan's office, climbed over the fence, went down into the park, and started cutting through the woods. Okay. Oh, uh, well, we both collapsed. I think so. I was being just sitting there. Michael's inability to maintain direct eye contact suggests discomfort or unease while discussing this part in the interrogation. This avoidance of eye contact can be indicative of internal emotional conflict, guilt, or reluctance to confront the severity of his actions. Michael's description of how he lured his younger brother and subsequently stabbed them with a little apparent remorse is chilling. The remorseless nature of the crime committed by Michael reveals a disturbing detachment from his closest people. Michael providing a detailed account of the final phase of the crime, including the escape to nearby woods to hide, indicates a willingness to cooperate with the interrogation process. Um, Can you kind of, okay, I'm a little bit lost, I think because there's too many people in this house. Um, there's you, there's Robert, okay, you're 16, he's 18, then who's next? Yeah, she's the third oldest, she was the first one. Okay, and then Daniel? And then Christopher. And then Christopher. And then Victoria. Victoria. And then She's four. Yeah, Victoria's four. Okay. And what's mom's name? April. April? April Beverly. Um, unmarried maiden name, I think you call it. It's Sharp. Sharp? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. 
And Victoria's four. Mm -hmm. And then what's Dad's name? Uh, David. David? Okay. David. And then, are there any other kids? How many kids is that? Um, That's... I think that was, she's a baby, she's about to turn two toddler. She was up in her bed. Okay. I think I was, he forgot about her. And I think she stayed asleep until the police came. So okay. I saw him give her out, so she's okay. It was, uh... So you saw them carrying her out? Yeah, yeah, I was in the car. Was it the plan was to kill her too, though? Okay. Yeah. Detective Rihanna Russell takes the initiative to reiterate the number of family members involved with an attempt to have a proper clarification and also have additional information based on Michael's willing participation in the interrogation. However, Michael shares a disturbing revelation. He told detectives that they had initially planned to kill even the youngest sibling, Autumn, but that Robert forgot about her. This detail explains the level of premeditation involved in their actions while also revealing a lapse in their plan. Michael also mentions seeing the youngest sibling safe in police custody when they were arrested. This suggests a degree of concern or relief regarding her well-being, adding complexity to his emotional state and motivations. So we talked a lot about your plans in the beginning, because here's what I don't understand is, um, as, you, as you and Robert are kind of planning things out, I mean, because you seem like a really smart kid, and that you kind of, I mean... It seems like you had some pretty detailed plans. You guys had good equipment and weapons. And it seems to me, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I would think that as you guys plan this out, you had maybe more specific plans like Robert was going to kill this person. Or yeah. You were going to kill. So who were you supposed to kill? I was supposed to take my pistol crossbow. Who was supposed to shank his soul? She was supposed to die quietly. Yeah, she was going to be the first one she was. And then um, Robert would go in, slit mom's to or push her over with him, and both go in and curl. And Victoria. Because it was supposed to be like quiet. Right? Yeah, it was supposed to be like And then I would go upstairs and uh, shoot David, dad, and the guy with my pistol crossbow which okay. would kill him. And then Robert would go over and kill him. Okay. In this part of the interrogation, Detective Benz seeks to extract detailed information about the attack. A subtle yet significant observation occurs when Michael, in the course of describing Robert's actions in their father's room, uses the name David instead of the more familiar dad. Although it's not an uncommon practice in Western culture to call parents by their name, but it is not appreciated either. This choice of terminology suggests a notable emotional disconnect between Michael and his father. The use of the father's first name rather than the affectionate or familiar term might imply a certain emotional distance or detachment from his father. This potentially shed light on their family dynamics, as David was quite strict with his children, and the kids were mostly homeschooled and did not do much social interaction as well. So, who, who all died? Who do you know died for sure? Like, what's the count? How do we know? I don't know. Okay. Who do you think died? Um, dad, mom, and the That's not all I know, because I saw them. And Daniel's the one that you stabbed? Um, no, Chris was one I stabbed. Daniel's yeah, the one he went in and uh, right, that's right. stabbed him in the box. And he was in the living room? Yeah, the living room yeah, yeah, with mom. And Christopher, you stabbed him in the neck? Yeah, he was in the bath, you know. So how did, I mean, was he still making noise when you left, or how did that go? Yeah, down? he was still yelling at my life, Tom. They were probably killed him. Um, I think he might have been alive because later like, I came back and the door was shot and locked its head and kicked it down. Okay. Um, just going to have those holes in that door. So. Um, you kicked it down? I didn't kick it down. Okay. I did? Okay. I just got it too. Nobody kicked it down. Oh. It stayed intact. I don't know what it's in there if he's still alive. Did you. Because um, here's what I'm seeing happen. You know, you guys had all these detailed plans, you had all the cool stuff to make it happen. Yeah. And it kind of started falling apart, and he said, like, it didn't go as planned. I think, I mean, did you kind of just freak out a little bit? Like, yeah, it was did. really happening? Well, I didn't, I didn't know it was going to be like. Yeah, you don't. But here's what's, here's what's getting me. is like, it's crazy because you guys worked together and made all these plans and, you know, had it all figured out. And then when it happens, you're just kind of standing there not doing anything. And did you did you decide like 
Robert's going to kill everybody, and I'm going to stand here and do nothing, so I better... I mean, did you... Is yeah, that, I, think, I think that was my point. I, was, I, I didn't want to kill anyone. Well, who didn't want, I couldn't do it. So I was going to let him, like, kill everyone. Yeah, you stab somebody in the neck. No, I mean, I just kind of... Detective Bentz is actively trying to gauge Michael's mental state, especially to understand his feeling, considering a few hours have already passed after the crime was committed. With Detective Bentz's consistent push, Michael admits Robert killed most of the members, minimizing his involvement. Detective Bentz employs a reverse psychology tactic by suggesting that both brothers wanted to be famous, encouraging Michael not to give away all the credit to Robert. This approach is aimed at motivating Michael to share more details by emphasizing his role and significance in the events. It plays on the desire for recognition or notoriety, potentially encouraging Michael to open up more. Um, so here's a problem that we might have, and, and I don't want it to be an issue for you because you've been really cooperative. Um, you know, we're going to talk to Robert too. So he's going to give us his version of the story. And you know, sometimes they're going to be different. So, um, is there anything that you kind of didn't quite tell me right, or you changed a little bit, and now that you understand that Robert's going to tell me everything? I, I, yeah. But, um, who could I tell you that I could forgive them? Because that's why I told him, you know, when we were sitting out in the woods, you know, to make conversation. But, you know, for instance, I'll show you how this uh, goes to food. What three? What do you mean you told him? So you told him you killed three people? Yeah, I told him because he asked me how many did you get. I said three. Did, did you know. tell him who you bought? No, I just said three. Um. So do you? I I guess this is my question for you. Do you think it's a lesser sentence if you killed one or if you killed three? No. What, I mean, I don't know, I, I think Robert, he may have, there's going to be a lot of differences, that's what I'm concerned about. And we don't want you to come off as a liar, I mean, because you've been real cooperative, you seem like a really good kid, you know, you graduated high school early, um, you're designing games, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff you got going on, and so I don't want people to get a bad opinion of you and think that you're the type of guy that lies to police when he's kind of caught, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so tell me, that I know that you're leaving something out. There's, I mean, because it, it's like she said, um, you know, you're, this isn't like you stole a bicycle, you know, know. this is the most you can do, but, you know, so it's a big deal. Um, but a lot of people, when they talk and think about this thing, your honesty is a big deal and how you handle yourself from here on out. And if you come off, because to me, you don't seem like a bad guy. You know, like, you don't scare me. I, I mean, I never, never thought you would have done this. So you just seem like a normal kid to me. And you seem like an honest kid. But see, I talk to people all the time. And I mean, I, I know when people are lying or when when... I'm not quite getting the whole story, and so I just want to catch you before you get in that bad spot where people start saying you're a bad guy, you're evil, you're a liar. So just tell me what I'm missing. Oh, I mean, along with the do thing, I was uh, going to on to like convincing the people who were still alive that like I was on the side. I called the police, you know, so they would like stay and I would get them. So they kind of stay on the ground and he. He'd be able to come stab him again. Yeah. Did you ever have to um, <clears throat> go get Robert to let him know someone was still making too much noise or anything? No, no, it was, it was uh, chaotic. He was just going from person to person. So, what yeah. kind of things did you say to them? Uh, but uh, the only things I like, said to them was when I was trying to convince them that I was with them, so they would, you know, come to me and could kill them. Okay. And that's all you think that he might tell me different? Um, Is he going to lie to me? I don't know. I don't think he would lie because I'm pretty sure the only reason he's like he want he let himself get arrested and stuff like getting him major shootout and dying from the police is because he wants to see the aftermath. 
Sorry, I'm always watching. In this interrogation section, Detective Bentz informs Michael that Robert will also be questioned, stressing the chance for Michael to correct any inaccuracies. Despite this, Michael remains composed, answering with confidence through direct eye contact and frequent head nods. He acknowledges the possibility of Robert lying about Michael's involvement due to an obsession with assuming full responsibility, offering insight into their motivations. Detective Bence's transparent approach, mentioning Robert's interrogation and the consequences of falsehoods, seems effective in encouraging Michael's cooperation and truthfulness. So you think he may kind of just tell us what happened to him? Yeah. Okay. Did you guys talk about... Um, being on the news and getting to see each other on TV and stuff. Yep. What kind of things did you say and talk about? Um, mostly about how we were playing by killing more people. You know, yeah. Talk. And um, we would become famous. We would get on the Wikipedia lists. Oh, okay. Those people. That's so, a big deal, yeah. I mean, do you think they might even make a movie or something or a TV show? I don't know about a TV show, but... Uh, did you guys talk about that? Yeah, definitely documentaries and stuff. Hmm. He just wanted to be famous. What did you want? Me? Mm-hmm. You keep talking about what he wanted. What did you want? Oh, no, I just wanted to go by the lunar school. Get a job. But you, I mean, you're, I mean, your big brother's telling you he wants to be famous and you guys are making these plans. Surely you want some I, of that fame too, do, right? Yeah, I do want to do it with him because, like, he's going to do it no matter what. He says, if I don't do it with him, they'll just kill me too. Or leave me there, so, um, you know. Michael shares significant information here about his intention to kill his family. He discloses that Robert insisted on his assistance with the attack, emphasizing Robert's active role in planning and executing the violence. Michael goes on to explain that Robert intended to kill all family members anyway and threatened to kill Michael if he didn't comply and join in. This revelation highlights the intimidating and manipulative tactics employed by Robert to ensure Michael's participation in the violent acts. Given the strong bonds between the two brothers, Michael's choice to participate in the violence can be seen as a survival instinct. However, there is no denying that Michael had opportunities to stop Robert, as he mentioned in the beginning that they were planning for this for two months. Moreover, during the interrogation, there is no significant proof that he regretted his action. He didn't shed a single drop of tears while describing how each member was killed. Thus, his intention to blame Robert for all the murders might not work out. Although Michael's disclosure of Robert forcing him to join in could potentially provide him with some benefit of doubt in the legal proceedings. Um, Kind of gave me a quick version of what he's saying that you did. And and you haven't told me everything, okay? So I know you're not being completely honest, and I I gave you one shot already. I'm sorry, I don't know what you might have said. I mean, I don't know. Well, you stabbed more than one person. So who else did you stab? Same. Or you stabbed more than just one time? Oh, I stabbed Christopher more than one time. How many times did you stab him? I think twice. Because you don't think we're going to know that? Stop I, thinking I and go with what you know. You mentioned forensics a minute ago. I know. I mean, I'm, I'm just one of like hundreds of people that are going to look at this thing, okay? I, I mean, we got, we got the state police coming in. Uh, there's, I don't know, 20 different forensic detectives at your house right now. Um, They're going to be there a long time because of the scene that it is. So everybody that you killed and every single stab wound that you inflicted, we're going to know about. And this is your last chance to just kind of let us know, to be honest, to man up and tell us exactly what you did and and start making it right. I had Christopher. I did not stab Victoria with Daniel. You did not stab Victoria. Yeah, yeah, I got, I, um, I think I had to stab mom. You stabbed him off. Yeah, I got, I got, when she was walking away, I think I had to go for the neck, but, you know, I, Is that when you cut yourself, then? Yeah, I think I'd have to do that. Where did you stab her? I think I had to go from behind and cut her whole body. Did you cut her? I think so, yeah. Yeah, this doesn't seem like something you have to think about. I know it's, it's, I, you're still kind of dealing with it. Um. And I wasn't there, I wasn't the one doing it. But you don't have to think about it. You know what you did. So you cut her neck, you stabbed Christopher in the neck. How many times did you stab Christopher? Two or three, I think. And who else did you stab? Besides mom. Mm -hmm. Because here's the thing, everybody's been stabbed. 
and you both had knives, and we know you both stabbed everybody. So you guys are kind of at the same level, and so now it's, who's going to be honest and make this right, and who's a liar? Okay, which one do you want to be? I'm not. Okay, so you're a man of your word? Yes. Okay. And do you want to make this right and do the right thing at this point in time? Yes. Okay. What else okay. are you missing? You want to start over then? Come on. You, you tell us where you need to start. He stabs I didn't stab I was stabbed to a twelve foot window. Detective Benz's direct confrontation with Michael about his role in the crime creates a pressure on Michael and a sense of urgency to address inconsistencies in his previous statements. Michael's nervousness becomes apparent in his facial expressions as he faces this confrontation. With forensic evidence and Robert's confession, Michael's defense finally starts to crumble. This shift in his narrative is a response to the change that Detective Benz made in terms of the intensity of his assertiveness in addressing Michael. We only stabbed, you only stabbed the, your family because they were in the way. Not, towards the bigger plan? Um, not, well, the reason we was to kind of kill family is uh -huh. um, they were in the way into you know, Ohio count. That's a parable. Just to thing. start off with a big count. So, um, so is this all a game? I mean, this higher count, how can you, is this a game? It's a, more like to kind of become famous, kind of get, you know, set a record. Did you, now, because you said, you said this yourself, you told Robert you killed three, yep. and so now we're stuck at the point where you've told us you stabbed Christopher and your mother. Mm -hmm. Is there one more person that you stabbed and, and you didn't mention earlier? No. Okay. I, I can state to my mom that I, I didn't stab anybody else, but this one How do How do you feel about what you've done now? I, I didn't like it the minute it started. I, I mean, how do you feel about your mother? I mean, you. I mean, she. You watched her get stabbed. You. You cut her throat yourself, and you watched her bleed all over the place and scream. How does that make you feel? Not. Not think about it. You don't want to think about it. And Christopher, your little brother. I mean, you stabbed him in the neck. What? Did, what has he ever done to you? So he's just a number. Yes. And how does? I mean, how do you feel about that now? It's it's what? Pointless. Pointless. Do you, um, do you, would you be willing to write us a statement kind of explaining what we just talked about? Yeah. Um, kind of start at the beginning. I was, like, I don't know if I can get that long. Um, yeah, pen and paper is what I'm talking about. In this concluding part of the interrogation, Michael finally admits to a sinister motive. The family's murder was just the start of a plan for mass killings, driven by a desire for fame through violence. When asked about his feelings regarding the violence against his mother and his little brother, Michael acknowledges his discomfort and emotional detachment, possibly stemming from deep-rooted psychological issues and disturbed family dynamics. He also reveals that at the time of the crime, he dehumanized them as just numbers in order to get famous. But now he recognizes the pointlessness of it all, hitting at a sense of regret. Although three years after the crime took place, Michael received his court verdict on May 10th, 2018. The jury, after more than five hours of deliberation, found Michael Beaver guilty of killing his parents and three younger siblings, as well as attempting to kill his then 13-year-old sister, who survived and became a key witness for the prosecution. The verdict was delivered based on the testimonies provided by Crystal Beaver and a wealth of evidence, including the interrogation footage. When Judge Sharon Holmes read the verdict, it had a profound impact on those present in the courtroom. Many of the jurors openly wept as the verdict was announced. Michael, upon hearing the verdict, fell to the floor and had to be assisted back into his seat by a sheriff's deputy. This dramatic moment marked a significant turning point in the legal proceedings surrounding the tragic case. Robert Beaver ultimately pleaded guilty to all charges and received a sentence of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Michael Beaver's trial commenced on April 16th, 2018, and he was sentenced on August 9th, 2018 to life in prison with the potential for parole. This case left a deep trauma in the hearts of the people of Oklahoma, particularly within the Broken Arrow community. The gruesome nature of the crime made neighbors uneasy and disturbed by the sight of the property. It served as a daily reminder of the tragedy, turning a once vibrant family home where children played into a place haunted by dark memories for all who bore witness to it.
Consequently, the city council made the decision to transform the property into a reflection park. As the city councilor, Mike Lester, expressed it, this place is a place that nobody wishes to remember, but one that nobody can ever forget. The park was an attempt to bend the perspective and create a positive narrative as a closure for this case. As we conclude this harrowing case, we are left with a profound sense of the impact that violence and tragedy can have on a community. The transformation of a once happy family home into a haunting reminder of the past serves as a stark reminder of the fragility of our lives and the enduring power of memories. As we reflect on this case, it prompts us to ask some challenging questions. Did the Beaver brothers consider the consequences of their plans? Did Michael kill his little brother Christopher and his mother just to save himself from Robert? Or did he have personal motivation in terms of gaining fame? How does a community heal from such deep wounds? A lady who seemed like an ordinary next door neighbor ended up killing her own mother, her best friend, an innocent man, and ruined many more lives. You doing okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. I can get some hot water for myself. If you needed cold water no. or something, just say. Did you ask him about the. No. What are you talking about? Is this going to be filmed? Because I always appear on the news on Chris Hayes. Oh, well, okay, I don't know about Chris Hayes, but in an in incident such as this, okay, to protect you, to protect me, um, we're, we're going to record it, okay, okay? just because um, that way, you know, it doesn't look like you're hiding anything, it doesn't look okay. like I'm hiding anything. Um, okay. Once it did, I just started shooting. And my thought, I just moved forward on him and kept shooting. My thought was to try to get past the doorway. At what point did you know you hit him? I knew I hit him the first time, or I thought I hit him the first time, but he just stood there and looked at me. And so I just kept on shooting because he was just standing there like, so I assumed I hit him because I was this close. I was so close. I had shot quite a few times. Before you fell? Yeah, okay. quite a few times. If you had to guess them, then how many shots do you think you fired? I don't know. I did all of them that was in there. You know and I think many, it was full. Do you know how many? Do you know how many rounds go in that I particular six. weapon? Six. I'm guessing. This is Pamela Hupp, but this is not her story. She does not deserve the spotlight like she so wants. This is the story of Betsy Faria, Russ Faria, Shirley Newman, and how Pamela ruined all their lives. All Pamela should be known for is her ruthless ways and little concern for others' lives. Stay with us till the end of this video and you'll have the same opinion. Let's first listen to this 911 call that Pamela made on August 16th, 2016. 911, where's your emergency? Hey, hello, there's someone breaking in my house. Help! What's Help. the address you're at? Come on! Want me to see you, 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 want me to see your wife? No, I'm not getting in the car with you. No, get What's away. Your address? Get out, get out, get out. Help. Ma'am, what's the address you're at? Uh, help, help. I have somebody breaking in. No, no, no. Hello? Spoiler alert, the call was staged, but during this call, Pamela had claimed yet another life. She had killed 33-year-old Louis Gumpenberger, who had suffered a brain injury in 2005 and had limited mental capacity since then. And here is the interrogation that followed. Oh, well, okay, I don't know about Chris Hayes, but in an in incident such as this, okay, to protect you, to protect me, um, we're, we're going to record it, okay, just because um, that way... You know, it doesn't look like you're hiding anything. It doesn't look okay. like I'm hiding anything. Um, okay. That way I don't misconstrue something you say down the road. You know, like I misinterpret something you said or I thought you said one thing and you actually okay. said another. So, okay. So, again, I appreciate you coming up here and talking to us. Um, I, I know that you wanted to come up here instead of um, talking to the scene, which is great. Um, I guess, 
is there, uh, just out of curiosity, is there a reason why you came up? Is it cooler here or something? No. Temperature wise? The officer said that I'd have to go back to here to oh. repeat everything. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So. I, did not, I didn't want to. But <laughs> Pamela's case is an excellent example of the dark triad in psychology, which consists of three personality traits, narcissism, Machiavellianism, and psychopathy. Machiavellianism, in simple words, means when someone is sneaky and manipulative, willing to trick others to get what they want. In this clip, you can see her manipulation working right away. Notice how she seems disinterested like she would rather be anywhere else than be here. This seems to be her way to make sure she is not coming off as guilty from any angle. But the detectives listen with intent because A, she is not a suspect yet. B, they are trying to build a rapport with her. Well, I appreciate you coming up here with us, okay? And, and we'll take you home. Um, I just want to go anywhere but home, there. Anywhere but there? So that's fair fine enough. to come here. Yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. Apologies for this interruption, but notice how Pamela interrupts the detective. You have to remember that she is someone who has successfully fooled multiple detectives, prosecutors, judges, and a jury already. So this has more or less become a hobby for her. Her confidence, the way she seems to take charge of the conversation, and the fact that she knows her story has to be plausible from the very beginning are enough to prove her mastery of manipulation. So, um, I, Ms. Huff, I don't know much um, about you. You keep throwing out these names and stuff like that, so I, I'm I'm trying to stay on top of all this. But I guess let's let's start with. Um, I, I really want to find out what happened today, so I'd like to get a very detailed account of like what happened today. And really, what I'd like to do is, if um, if at all possible, probably start maybe maybe like last night. You know, let's like work the 24 hours beforehand and and work all the way through the incident. Make sure there's nothing that you saw or heard or something that might have happened or or something like that. I don't want to miss anything. So let's let's try to go back like 24 hours or so. Maybe yesterday afternoon lunch. Okay. Um, and let's uh, work our way forward. Yesterday I went to Best Buy and um, purchased some items and talked to the general manager there about getting a job for my nephew. Went home, got my nephew, said to bring him up, brought him up there. He talked to him for a little bit. We came back and we filled out some applications online. Um, went to Taco Bell, had lunch. Um, then I went home. And then... So what time did you go to Best Buy, did you think? Uh, if you had to guess. Well, I was there right when it opened, so I think that's 10 o'clock. Okay. Because we had to wait in the parking lot a few minutes. Okay. Perfect. So I think it was 10 o'clock. St. Peter's one. Uh, yeah, by the mall. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And um, I was there, like I said, came all the way back to Fallon, got my nephew, went back up there, stayed up there a little bit, then we came back, had lunch, I dropped him off. Oh, dropped him off, we filled out applications, three applications for Best Buy, instructions he had given us, and then I went home. And then um, walked my dog, fed him, did all that kind of stuff. My husband came home, we had, I left and I went to Shop and Save, at 3.30. Okay. It may seem rather insignificant what Pamela did the previous day, but during an interrogation, such seemingly trivial questions are very important. They can help establish the basic body language of the subject. Here we notice how she doesn't meet the detective's eyes very often, how she seems to be randomly playing with something in her hand, and even casually wipes off the table. In a nutshell, she looks bored and her response seems rehearsed. The detectives can analyze changes in her basic body language to understand which questions trigger her more and when she is most vulnerable. Then she speaks for six to seven minutes, describing her daily activity, but hesitates. I was going to go back to the mall. So I came home because I knew I had to let the dog out then. So I came home, let the dog out. So you went by, I'm sorry, you went by whose house? My daughter. daughter What's her name? Of, uh, Sarah. Go ahead, I'll try to meet in her. Um, you said she lives off of what? Um, you take first capital. I don't want to be able to say it on the table. I don't understand. She, she's a teacher, so I don't, she don't need that. Um, off of first capital. Um, and she wasn't there. Now, this makes it evident that Pamela is very aware that she's being recorded and all her responses are well calculated. I just drove down the street, she wasn't there. Sure. Um, so, um, so you said circle back going home, 
Yeah, I just want, I got caught the high, or came back down and went through, um, just cut through where Lyndon Wood is. She lives right there. Cut through there and got on the highway and went home. Okay. And then what? Um, I got home, opened up the garage, pulled in, got my dog, walked him out in front so he could go pee. And he did, he did his thing. Um, went back, put him inside, gave him a treat. <clears throat> Came back out. I was going to run back up to the mall. Uh, I was supposed to pick up a purchase that I from Best Buy and make an appointment. My appointment's Friday. I was going to run up there, see if I could get it early. Um, so I was going to run back up there. And as I, st I started pulling out and got halfway out, I noticed as I was backing out, that a car came down really fast on the cross street and whipped around right in front of my driveway because I'm right at the end. Here's the cross street and here's my driveway. So oh. they came out and did this right in front of my driveway and I looked up because it was so fast and startling and somebody jumped out and I was like, wow, somebody, I don't know what I thought, somebody was hurt, I don't know what was going on. It was so fast and then he ran up, I was halfway off the dry where I was parked, and he jumped in my car. He opened up the door and jumped in my car. Which door? The uh, passenger. Front or back? Oh, front. Or passenger front. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And um, he had a bunch of stuff in his hands. I don't know what he had, but he had a knife also, but he had something in his other arm. I don't know what he had. And. Um, he put a knife and kept going, um, just yelling random stuff like you're going to take me to the bank and get Russ's money. Let us give you a little background to understand who Russ is. So Pamela was friends with Betsy Faria, who was battling breast cancer. Pamela was responsible for driving Betsy to her doctor's place and back home. In fact, Betsy had named Pamela as the sole beneficiary of $150,000 in her life insurance policy. A mere four days later, after that policy was amended, on December 27, 2011, Russ Faria found his wife, Betsy, murdered in their home. On November 21, 2013, Russ was sentenced to life in prison, despite having a solid alibi. Life in prison without parole for a man convicted of stabbing his wife 55 times. Russ Faria is already hoping to appeal the case to, a, to get a jury to hear suppressed evidence revealed by the Fox Files. Due to Betsy's insurance money and inconsistencies in Pamela's story, Russ was given a retrial, and finally, on November 6, 2015, he was found not guilty. The law was finally catching up to her, but she was not ready to give up the money or get punished for the crimes she committed. So, somehow, after all this, on August 16, 2016, Pamela made the 911 call to divert the attention of the authorities and frame Russ for yet another crime. Take me to the bank, you're going to take me to the bank, you put a knife up to my throat there and was yelling stuff. And um, he kept looking behind him like this. So I didn't, I put it in gear and I was thinking how it's going to get out of there when he was looking. And he kept yelling, coming back. And then he looked back again and I hit his arm with the knife and then shot out of the car and ran inside. Okay, so you were, I just want to make sure I understand. So you were, you'd already been home, fed the dog, gave him a street. You were getting ready to leave. So when you when you got home, did you leave the car in the driveway, or did you pull in the garage? I was in the garage. Okay, so you pulled the car all the way in. Yes. And then you got out and you tied it to the dog. No, I did not pull it in the garage. I always pull it in the garage when I'm going to stay. But no, I stayed right there because I was leaving. Okay. So, so right where it was. So where it was still where running. Was, yeah, okay. I just ran in to to let him out. Okay, so you were only in the house just a couple. Of, I was just, more. Oh, not even a couple minutes, just enough to put his leash on. I brought him out, walked him, blah, 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 okay. all that kind of stuff. Even if we keep an open mind when judging her, it's very clear that this is no one's reaction when they've been ambushed and attacked by someone. Is this how you would react after having shot somebody? Remorse is secondary. Pamela doesn't seem to be scared, confused, or even shocked by the whole experience. On top of that, staying quiet for a while before answering or responding with blah, 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 etc. are, in fact, very smart ways to get the response right. Now, we know that the detectives can catch the culprits by the way they fumble and how their stories do not match up. But Pamela does not seem to worry about that, because she doesn't even answer the questions directly. Instead, she gives a vague response that could mean multiple things. The 
garage, the big one was open, and I ran through the garage door. Okay, so then kind of rushed through that. I just want to make sure I understand. So you went in, you let the dog out, you gave a treat, you're ready to leave again. So you come back out of the house. How did you exit the house? How? Out the same door. Same door. Okay. Yeah, I let him in the same door because the front door was locked. So it was coming in, I come in and out that door. Um, came out that door, got back in the car okay. to go again. Okay. And that's when the car shot around and somebody jumped out. Before I knew it, they were sitting next to me. Okay, so let's first describe the car. Can you, can you give a description of the vehicle? Well, I wasn't really paying attention to the vehicle, more of the um, shriekness of their tires that they did. It was a, just a silver. Um, it wasn't as small as like a little Toyota, a little bit bigger, but not a big one sedan. It was four doors. So four door, mm -hmm. mid, you would say mid-size? Yeah, that? probably mid-size. Wasn't brand new. Um, I mean, as you reflect back, do you remember anything, anything specific about, other than being silver, I mean four doors, anything on that you said? It wasn't that new. No, else? it wasn't like shiny. Like you could tell it was, like my crash. I just had a two thousand four Honda, kind of like older, like that. You know, not that it was a piece of crap or anything, but it was, yeah. It was a veteran car. Yeah, grocery getter, and um, it was getting weird, and it was like because they tore around, and he popped out, and I'm like, my first thought was, did I know him? because they did it so fast, but then I was like, and I looked back down, and next thing I knew, he was there, so. Okay, so, as I, I was I was up there for a few minutes, and I noticed that there was a, an orange car parked on the street. That's my next door neighbor's, it's okay, broke it's your down. Neighbor's car. Okay, mm -hmm. I wasn't sure, I didn't know where it's that came It's broke down. Okay. So, I'm trying to remember how your street is, which way did the, so if you're sitting in your car, pointed at the, garage which way did this car come from um right here the right side that that little street there i don't know what it's called so the street behind you behind me yes because the way i uh, and i'll probably have you draw it out later but so not so the street behind you mm -hmm. i know what you're talking about mm -hmm. i remember being there okay. it's almost it's directly behind my neighbor's driveway okay. and i'm one over so i can i could see them whip around come out of there and all they did was come right around, right to my house. Okay. So he jumps out of the car. He jumps into the passenger front side of your car. Mm -hmm. Where does he jump out of the silver car from? I don't know. They asked me that. I really wasn't paying attention. I, I want to say the back seat, but that may not be true. For something that did not happen, she sure remembers a lot of little details. Her hands are consistently working, trying to paint a picture for the detectives and make herself sound more convincing. She doesn't give a solid answer to avoid being boxed in her own responses. She has the presence of mind to keep her options open. Were there other people in the vehicle? There was a drive. All I saw was a driver um, because he squealed away. So I was like, what the hell? And he looked. Um, what was the most distinctive thing about the driver that you remember? Dark hair. was kind of like a buzz cut. Um, and dark skin, like um, Hispanic, maybe, something like that. It, what crosses my mind, I don't know. It could be anybody. I don't know if they were Hispanic, but um, that's what crossed my mind. Okay, so you got, a, you got somewhat of a look of the driver. Yeah. Okay. So the guy squealed away mm -hmm. before, before he, well, I don't know what the words are about. At what point did he get out? Did he squeal away? Well, with with in, in comparison to what the other guy was doing, right? As soon as he pulled around, and I wasn't looking again, I looked back down to put, you know, to get ready to go and stuff, and um, I pulled around, and I looked up again. The guy had shot out when he pulled around. The guy like shot out, and I looked down again and thought. She's getting repetitive and almost fumbles, but the manipulator in her does not let her confidence crumble. Yet. Kind of strange. I don't even know if I thought it was strange, but it was weird. And so I looked up again as he was getting out, and he squealed right off. The guy squealed right off. like. So 
What, if anything, did he say? He said, you're going to take me to the bank and get Russ's money. We're going now, so get going type stuff. And he just kept yelling stuff like that at me. And um, so at this time, I still don't, I don't have it in gear or anything. Like, or I do have it. No, I don't have it in gear. And I had put it in gear to go because I didn't know what to do. And then I, that's when I noticed he was looking back. I don't know what, if he's looking because cars, I don't know what he was looking at, but he kept looking back and I noticed that. So I put it back in the gear and he said, get going right now. We're going to the bank. And then he looked back again like this and I hit his arm and I shot out of the car. So when you say I put it back in the gear, mm -hmm. you mean you put it back in the park? Mm -hmm. okay. So right. my plan was to get out of the car somehow. Now you will watch her describe the victim and notice how detailed she is. Um, and now, forgive me, I, I have not, I did not go in the scene, I have not been in the scene, okay. so is he a white male, black male, oh, I'm sorry. Hispanic male? He's white male, white male. Um, he's taller than me, um, he had blue gym shorts on, um, and some sort of t-shirt, and what sandy color? blonde hair, and... I want to say his eyes were blue, but I'm not sure. It's not like they were like a bright blue or anything like that, noticeable. But I want to say they were light colored eyes. They weren't brown, okay. I don't think. I could be wrong. I really wasn't looking at his face. No anything, any smells? He didn't, no, he didn't smell. The only thing I noticed was is he's yelling and getting more and more upset. He was slurring his words. I thought he was drunk. I didn't smell anything at all. But he did have, I don't know what he had with him, but he kept, like the more he kept repeating himself, he was getting all excited and he was, uh, I thought he was drunk or on drugs or something like that because I couldn't understand him half the time. Right. He was yelling crap. I couldn't even understand. Who notices what your attacker smells like? And how can you not break down or feel shocked that you've just killed a living person, even though he was an alleged attacker? People who kill in self-defense are disturbed by killing people, and some even suffer from PTSD all their lives. But Pamela doesn't seem to feel any of that. The second aspect of the dark triad is psychopathy, characterized by a lack of empathy, impulsivity, and a disregard for social norms and moral values. And he was, uh, I thought he was drunk or on drugs or something like that because I couldn't understand him half the time. Right. He was yelling crap, I couldn't even understand. This seems to be the most dominant aspect in Pamela Hupp. Not only did she take so many lives, but she also lied about it, framed others, and fooled the authorities. In addition to this, she also did some very strange stuff. The cars in Pamela's neighborhood and workplace were found keyed many times. Her neighbors received strange handwritten notes and animal carcasses at their doorstep. Now, throughout the video, you can notice different aspects of the dark triad highlighted in her personality. In the next clip, you can again sense Pamela's manipulation when she tries to indirectly compliment the detectives. Also notice how she dodges their technique to provide her an alternative to check if she sticks to her story. I didn't notice like greasy hair, like a homeless person or anything like that. Okay. Um, he just looked like a normal person to okay. me. I mean, he wasn't clean cut. like. Like you guys, like you're grown. Mm -hmm. Of course, it begs the question. I, I don't know that we just asked you straight. Have you ever seen this guy before? No. Nope. Don't know him. Um, he doesn't look like somebody you've seen somewhere before with somebody else. I mean, as you as you remember back, you know, as you picture him in your mind, um, there there is you cannot make any link between this guy and and you. No, I mean, I wasn't looking directly at his face. I was trying not to look at him. I do know when he did get in, there was something familiar about him, but I don't know him. So I don't know if I, it, I don't know. He seemed familiar, like I should know him, but I do not know him. And forgive me if Kevin asked this. Did he have, I know you say he's a Caucasian male, mm -hmm. but did he have any type of accent that was noticeable to you? I didn't know because he was, well, he was bumbling 
slurring and at first I didn't really notice anything but like I said, he was getting so excited mm -hmm. and stuff he as he was yelling at me I mean it was like he was drunk I mean he was I literally like his tongue was this thick I didn't know what was going on I figured he was on something or something I didn't know I, I knew something was not right because as he was getting excited it was getting worse but he said one phrase inside made no sense. He said, you know, I think he said it out in the garage or out in the car too. Uh, something about killing my wife. Something. And I'm like, I mean, I didn't say anything, but it was weird. Pamela is trying everything in her power to blame Russ for this staged attack. Killing his wife can easily be related to Russ's wife, Betsy. And he was jammering stuff again about killing me. Again, my focus was to get in the house. I knew I had my phone in my pocket. I was trying to dial 911. I think I did it three times before it went through on my cell phone. By then I was inside and he was trying to get the door. I was trying to hold the door. I couldn't get it locked in. And I was trying to get 911 on the phone. And he was saying stuff. And then the door flew open. He got in, it flew open. And I ran into the bedroom. He was yelling stuff. and. Before, as I was going in the bedroom, something again about killing my wife, him and Stevie. Me and Stevie, you're going to kill your wife. And I, so I don't know who that is. I don't know a Steven or a Stevie or a Steve. I don't know what he was talking about. He was so then, so but It was really hard. It's like his sentences weren't formed by then. Mm -hmm. And so none of it made any sense. But he did keep saying, get in the car. I ran in the bedroom, I tried to, you know, I shut that door, I was trying to get it locked, wouldn't latch, got a problem with the door, and um, I got my gun, turned around, got my gun, night stand right there, and he was pounding on the door, and once it flew open, that's when I shot him, and I just kept shooting him, because he just kept standing there. How many times did you say you pulled the trigger? I unloaded the whole gun. Okay. So you pulled the trigger until it stopped firing? I just kept pulling until it stopped. Because everybody kept saying, that's a little gun, and blah, 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 and I couldn't get a club. So once that door opened and he was there, I just started shooting and walking towards him until I didn't have him more. She makes a whole fictitious story to claim that she shot Lewis in self-defense. But notice how she ends a long sentence every time. She lets the gravity of her words set in, and more often than not, leans her face on her hand. She sits there like, there's that, nothing too important. Unless she's used to seeing blood and dead bodies often, this is not the demeanor of a normal person who has just killed a man. Yeah. Let me just, let me get, you know what? I'm going to step out for a second, get some white pieces of paper, okay. and I'll be right back. So, okay. sit right Should I tell him or just wait? Yeah, just, wait. just hold on. Let me get just paper. Yeah, on piece of paper. It's easier to visualize it if we're seeing it actually draw on. You good on water? What type of gun? What type of gun do you know? I mean, do you um, know? Was it a nightstand? You said it was a little gun. I didn't I'm know. I'm gonna say a 32. Okay. Is that a gun? It's got a. Or maybe a 380. Well, maybe that's it. I just got it for Christmas last year. Okay. <laughs> After the one gal stalked me, I got it. That's what I got for a Christmas present. It seems like she's just chatting about a murder mystery series she's watched, not an incident that happened right in front of her eyes. Manipulators and liars are good with words and stories, but here we need to understand that Pamela seems like a hardcore narcissist too, which completes the last part of the dark triad. Narcissism refers to an inflated self-image, seeking constant attention, and even exploiting others to achieve one's goals. Did you have a sexual relationship with Betsy for real? Well, on what basis? What sexual to you? Did you ever tell law enforcement officials that you and Betsy were having a sexual relationship? I did. She had a mad crush on me. She really, really, really loved me. Loved me at that time. And it just kept growing from that. So it's rather interesting to note that her own false confidence and self-image curtails her senses. For example, if we were lying about this situation, we would probably pretend to care and act scared about the fact someone is after our life. Pretend to show remorse that we just killed a man and finally, pretend to act like we did not enjoy it. But Pamela can't even think about these basic things. So, <clears> that's <throat> your first time. You, I guess your fingers aren't working? No, they worked. Just couldn't get through 911, though? 
it wouldn't go through. I mean, get my phone. Well, actually, um, that's actually, I'm glad you brought that up because it, do you mind if we take a look at your phone and see? Because I, I would love to see what the 911 call. Well, bring it in here because I'd like to see too. Yeah, well, it's out on the desk, but we'll see. Yeah. I would see how many times I dialed. Yeah, I'm just curious. I just wanted to. I would say a couple times. I okay. dialed it trying to get through. I could see it wasn't going through. I couldn't hear anybody. So I would just hang out, try again, try again. And I'm just, and he's bumping me on the door and stuff. So then he just was, once I got them, I, I was focused on that and he pushed it open. I don't remember. All I remember, and just kind of blanked out there, is that once that door flew open, because I was so hoping it wouldn't, once it did, I just started shooting. And my thought, I just moved forward on him and kept shooting. My thought was to try to get past the doorway. At what point did you know you hit him? I knew I hit him the first time, or I thought I hit him the first time, but he just stood there and looked at me. And so I just, just kept on shooting because he was just standing there like, so I assumed I hit him because I was this close. I was so close. So you're legitimately I'm walking this at him. So the first time you shot him, would you say you're further than this away from him? Me and you? Maybe this far. So, and the, okay. Maybe from here to you. And the door opens out. The door it opens into the bedroom. Okay, so it, yeah. yeah. So if I was coming into your bedroom, it would open this way or this Towards way? Towards me, yes. So I'm standing here and in one of these positions here in front of the door, it swings open. I'm standing there, I'm ready. Okay. And it swings open and we're just eye to eye and I just start shooting and walking forward because my first thought was to get past this door jam. Okay. Didn't even think about I'm shooting him, hitting him. Wasn't thinking about that. I knew I had to get around this person and get back out somehow. At what point did he fall? Do you remember? I had shot quite a few times. Before you fell? Yeah. Okay. Quite a few times. If you had to guess them, then how many shots do you think you fired? I don't know. I did all of them. That was in there. And I think it was full. Do you know how many rounds go in that particular weapon? Six. I'm guessing. The interrogators are employing a technique called the questions and answers method. By continuously posing questions, investigators can uncover inconsistencies and gauge her reactions. But Pamela has done this interrogation bit before and gotten away with a crime. So she knows what she's doing. The usage of phrases like, I don't know, I don't remember, maybe, can't swear by it, are keeping her safe even now. Despite her emotionless and almost cheerful mood, it cannot be confirmed that she is, in fact, guilty. And when you stepped over him, he wasn't moving. Did you make any observations of him when you stepped over him? No. No. I was worried about getting my dog and getting out there. All I knew is he was down and he wasn't moving as far as I could tell or saying anything. So that was good for me at that point. Do you know, I mean, do you know where, where you hit him? I mean, was, were you, I mean, did you take him? No, I was going right part? here. So. I was going right for the mask. Okay. Okay. I know I'm not good enough shot to shoot you in the head because that was too. When's the last time you went to the range before this? I've never been to the range. Are you, you, I'm sorry, you and your husband go out shooting, you said? Yeah, uh, that was last, last fall. Last fall. So about a year ago almost. Quite shot. Yeah. Just shy of a year. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's the first time I you shot? I grew up shooting. No, I grew up shooting. No, but is that the first time you shot that gun? Yes. Yes. Pamela is showing the signs that most killers exhibit. Thirst for acknowledgement. Watch how happy she gets when her technique is given a minor recognition. She is her biggest fan. Here's another question for you. Because it's, it's unusual, here's what I say, without some type of tactical training or military training or law enforcement training is to fire and then approach the target. Where'd you learn that? Or is that? Uh, I mean, I so did what, it. Well, one reason I ask is, I mean, when you and your husband go out, does he, besides the shooting, do you guys work on tactical movements or something <laughs> like that? You, we just shoot at the target on a tree. Okay. The, because my thought was to get the hell out of that room is what I wanted to do. I didn't want to be pinned in that small space because my room's really small because there just was no way to get out. If he got in, I wasn't getting out. So I just walk forward at him partially was I wanted to get out of that room and partially was I wanted to be sure I hit him. And he was not advancing at that point. You well, were. 
These I was were, advancing. Yes, but he yeah. was. No, well, he had just he had just knocked the door open, and I started shooting. Okay. And I'm walking as I'm shooting. All right. So, because when I as soon as that happened and I shot, he just nothing. So I didn't even think I hit him because he just stood there then, and I just kept shooting, and then I went. My dog was running all over the place and. Now here's when the detectives dive deep into Pamela and Russ's history with each other. Okay. I'm trying to think of all the details here. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's some history with, with past things, and that's why they said they wanted Russ's money, correct? They said something about Russ mm -hmm. going to the bank. Kind of got to dig in a little bit. He said it's on one point aspect. the money that I stole from Russ. At one point in the car, you know, because he kept saying, we're going to the bank, you're getting Russ's money. And I'm like, get out of my car. Who are you? What are you talking about? At first, I didn't even know what the hell he was talking about. And at one point, he had said the money you stole from Russ. When I stepped out, you guys discussed that all the time? Uh, no, I mean. I think I told yeah, he, one of the other officers. Okay. Yeah. He had said that at some point and that. And still, it didn't click with me. I was just worried about getting out of there. I don't know what the hell. The guy was so thick-tongued that even when he said stuff, it took, with everything going on and how he was talking, a second for like, what the hell is this guy talking about? It just was so mumble-jumble. It didn't make sense. Some of them weren't complete sentences. Um, it, was, it was frightening. <clears throat> Not to get too personal here, but can you kind of fill me in, fill yeah, us in, fill us in. in on the financial aspect of the Faria stuff and where all that stands mm -hmm. now? Um, she had signed over I me mean, as beneficiary, and I was paid out. How much? One hundred fifty thousand. Okay. And I still have that one hundred fifty thousand. Okay. And. That's known to people that I still had the hundred fifty thousand because broadcasted that because at one point when I was talking to prosecutors up in Lincoln County, she kept going, "Do you have that money? Can I see your account? You know, whatever." And I just brought it up to her in cash and gave it to her. And so when I was at trial you, for it, you, it, I'm sorry to interrupt you. That was the judge asking for that, or the no, prosecutor? Prosecutor. prosecutor. She was asked. asking to see if I still had. She okay. goes, "Do you still have them?" Okay. And I said, "Yeah." And she goes, "Well, can you show me that you still have it?" Okay. Whatever. So you brought it up and showed her. And I did, and okay. I brought up a bag, and I gave it to her, and I had cash in it. In 2014, Betsy Faria's daughters, Leah and Maria Day, had sued Pamela over the life insurance money of $150,000. Despite all their efforts, they lost the case to their mother's killer, Pamela. As the interrogation proceeds, Pamela is trying to strategically steer the conversation in a way which would make the detectives question Russ's role in this whole ordeal and how she was being nice. And she goes, well, I want to change my beneficiary to you. Well, I want my kids to have it. I don't want Russ to have it. If Betsy thought she didn't have anything else in the world, she would want me to have whatever she had. In her view, I was rich in her eyes. She'd always tell me I was rich. <laughs> she thought I was rich. She wished she was rich like me. I wasn't rich. <laughs> At the end of her life, she was somebody that didn't have much in the way of financial resources. Is that fair to say? He just got out. So he had, he had just been released when you went back to trial for the daughters. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he knew the cash story. Okay. And he knew, because he was sitting behind us at the trial, that I still had the money. Okay. And... Right after, um, after that, um, the place, I don't think he knows this, but the place where I had my hair done, um, him and his cousin went there and confronted a hairdresser there. Was this on phone? Yeah, and the police were called and everybody. I this. Yeah, okay. and because somebody wrote something on Facebook. That's how violent he is. And they came and were screaming at this poor girl because they didn't like what she wrote. And I know there was a gun involved with the owner. They, everybody was getting that worked up and stuff. The police were called. I don't know what happened to it. 
when's the last time have you ever had any conversation with them through any medium, social media, phone, in person with Russ? At the um, girls' trial in January, um, he was there and he's just kept lurking around and all that. And um, we kind of ran into each other going to the bathroom and stuff on a break. And I said to him, Oh, congratulations on your release. I'm not say to him, I was just being nice. And uh, he said, Oh, thanks. And that was it. And turned around and walked away. He had like, his cousin with him, just his cousin, the same cousin that confronted this hairdresser. So um, that's the last time I've seen him, or, and that's, we didn't really speak, we just said that. Something nice thing. Let's take a second and talk about Russ, whose already sick wife was mercilessly murdered by someone. He knew Pamela did it. Then he was framed for her death by the murderer herself. Imagine the trauma and grief. Now, just after he gets out of the jail, he receives a text from Pamela congratulating him for being out of jail, when she was the reason he was in there in the first place. It's a clear sign of narcissism, which involves constant validation and attention. Pamela may be dismissive or indifferent to the emotions of those around her, and due to the psychopathic aspect in her personality, she even enjoys others' pain. When you knock the gun out of or the, gun, the knife, do you know did it fall out of his hand or did it stay in his hand? I hit it as hard as I could, or I hit him, and I think it fell. Okay. In my mind, it fell. Okay. Didn't stop to look. I, at the same time, opened the door and just ran out. I know we just talked at length about about what happened um, today. I just did one of those. Where? In the ambulance. Okay. Um, was it as detailed as what we've just discussed here? I think so, yeah. You think so? Okay. You know what I'll do? I'm going to go track it down. Okay. I'll, I want to read through it and maybe might have you come back and clarify some things for me if, the, right. if the statement wasn't too terribly clear, okay? Um, you said you haven't eaten any lunch or anything? Is it, are you hungry or you're okay? Okay, is your water okay for now? No, sorry. You good? Okay. Give us a few minutes and we'll be back, okay? Pamela is left alone in the room for some time. According to the read technique, investigators can do this to either regain emotional control after a heavy interrogation session or discuss further strategies. In Pamela's case, however, they may have done this to check the authenticity of her statements with respect to the Russ Faria case. Such breaks also build pressure on the subject. In this case, watch how the investigator has to keep her engaged so that she doesn't ask for a lawyer. How are you doing? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the restroom real fast and then I'll be right back. Um, you good? Anything I can get you? My stuff yeah, I'm person? supposed to get my husband. Yeah, I think you, I? Uh, Detective Wolf was going to go down, or Sergeant Wolf was going to go down there and talk can to Can I you. call my lawyer? Yeah. Do I need my lawyer Wait. up here? Do you? Well, how long am I going to be up here? You're up here voluntarily. No, I know, but... We're not holding you. No, I know, but how okay. long... They're going to kill me if I don't have one, just because of everything that's been going on. Should I call them, or, should, or are we going to be here much longer? Okay. You are here. You are here of your own free will. Okay, okay. you have to make those decisions for yourself. Okay. I can't. Well, I didn't tell know you what, what you guys needed. No, let me let me tell you what, what we still have left to do. Okay, um, you know, in this incident, um, we need to make sure that we can separate your DNA from his DNA. So what we'll do is, once we get a search warrant and all that stuff at the house, we'll swab him for DNA, and then um, they'll do swabs in the house and, and, and that kind of thing to make sure that he wasn't inside your house somewhere else from doing something they should have been doing. On, and the flip side, we also get your DNA because we want to make sure that we don't confuse, like, that we know whose DNA is in the house, okay? Um, so we, we were going to do that. Two, um, we were going to, what else? Oh, we need, we we're going to take photographs. Uh, we were going to have a county ID come up and take photographs of you just showing your injuries or lack thereof, or, you know, what, you know, just to show in case tomorrow some bruising appears, you know, we can document the stages of whatever happens going forward, okay? And then three, um, and so, yeah, so I'm going to get some forms for the consent for the DNA for a swab, and the swab is, it's like a Q-tip rubbed inside the cheek, I put it in a box, seal it away, I do one on each side of the cheek, and then it, it gets to the lab, and his DNA will be sent to the lab, your DNA will be sent to the lab, and then any swabs we take from his vehicle, from the vehicle, showing that his DNA was on the knife, those types of things. Um, and so we just want to make sure that we have all that done, okay? Um, and then, what else am I missing? Oh, the phone. Uh, your phone, if he has a phone on him, uh, we'll do a search warrant on his phone and see who he's been talking to, uh, and who's been contacted him. Uh, it, with your consent, we would like to, to glance through your phone. Um, you know, just make sure that you weren't getting any calls or, you know, there, there isn't anything going on on your end of the phone. Um, and that helps us 
clear view. Um, you know, of no, you're making sure that you don't know this guy and this guy doesn't know you and those mm -hmm. types of things. So those are just steps that we have to take in the investigation, okay? Um, another thing I want to ask you was, um, I guess your husband told the officers of a, of a subject who was um, sitting on the sewer yesterday, maybe? Thought the subject was sitting on the sewer, um, not doing much of anything. At some point, he, I don't know if the guy knew that your husband was there or in the area or whatever, but he just kind of like stood up. He never looked back he never and he walked too. away. So I, I guess my question for you is, do you recall recently coming, the recent hours, days, uh, weeks um, of anything that's occurred around your house? There have been, uh, me and my husband were leaving our house, I guess it's been a month ago, and there was, and I couldn't even tell you, it was a light color vehicle. I wasn't really paying attention. I did notice the person in it, like I couldn't describe him, but it was the same person. And I said to my husband, I go, that car, what does that car keep, I think that car is casing me, is what I said. And he blew it off as a joke. But I kept seeing it like a couple of days in a row. It was parked, and then it would just drive off. Okay. And I said that to him. That's been about a month ago. Okay, so nothing for the last month. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then nothing you didn't see this guy sitting on the sewer. No. You didn't see anybody else creeping around the house or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. Again, uh, uh, Sergeant Wolf is down there. Is talking to your husband right now. Um, you know, like I said, you're here. You're here voluntarily to talk to us to help us get through this. Okay. Um, you know, we're not holding you here. Um, but you know, you're, I, the way I look at it is you're helping me. So, um, then the detectives take DNA samples from her and read out the statement to her. She starts joking around and seems to think that her charm is working on the officers. Her narcissistic tendencies inhibit her from realizing that people can see her for what she is, a clear, remorseless psychopath. So did that sound? I mean, pretty much, yeah. Well, I mean, pretty much, I, I read that, I tried to read that word for word. I mean, no, that is, I mean, that's exactly what happened. It wasn't as detailed, probably, as you no, as we talked about stuff it. out with me, but... Mm -hmm. Well, we also went back yeah. to yesterday, so... Um, okay, so right now, I think the one thing that we would be waiting on is to have somebody come up here and take photographs of you. Um, if you want to walk around or do whatever, you're free to do so. Um, we, I mean, we would like you to hang around just so we could get that, you know, get that done. And if there's anything that comes up, but once we get in the house, we might have additional questions. I don't know. Okay. Um, so I mean, we'd like you to hang around. Um, I got a call me if I don't have my phone. Well, where are you going to go? I don't know yet. Will you probably be with your husband? Yeah. How about you call your husband? It's a lot. Do we have, um, do we have this phone number? You're just smart, I like one, aren't you? No, um, no. I'm no. playing. I'm playing. You always look like you're a goofing. Um, yes, I'll probably do that. Need another water? It's cold. If it's closed. I mean, Try don't her. go. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yep. And I'm just messing with you because oh. you always look like you're kidding around. <laughs> I always look like you're kidding around that one time there, right? Just the once. All right. <laughs> She was chit-chatting with the detective for a long time, talking about how beautiful Naples is, what kind of work it takes to manage a business of flipping houses. Her conversations were so casual and lacking in empathy that they did not even hint at the fact that there was a dead man lying cold in her own house. Then she starts talking about her dead mother. Oh, but I'll say this, I, I appreciate you coming up here today and being as open with us as you have. I know there's other things you guys are gonna be doing today, but I appreciate it. Not really, I actually feel safer up here. Yeah. I didn't know what to do when I was in the um, driveway and stuff, like, safe-wise. Because I kept thinking, she kept saying, they're, they're coming, they're on their way, and I kept thinking you were going around the corner, around the corner, and it never happened. So I didn't know what to do, and then once they put me in the ambulance, I felt a lot better. Very good. And then the ambulance, people treat you all right? Oh, yeah. Awesome. The policemen were nice, and everybody was nice. It just, I feel bad I, when I talk. I'm so scrambled because I can't help it. What's up? <laughs> my whole family's here. We came back when my father died to help my mother. 
and uh, we've been here ever since. That was in 2000 he died. So we've been back ever since to help her. But uh, let me think about it after this. Well, I was just curious. What would you do? I, do, I don't know. Yeah. Don't know. I don't know. I, if this is home, you, I don't know. It doesn't really feel like it right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Your mom still lives in the area? My mom died. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. She uh, died. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, oh, well, it gets better. She died in uh, two years ago. Two years in October. And Chris Hayes posted stuff that I killed her. Because she felt she was the one who felt the balcony and Fenton. They thing broke down the spindles and she fell. He tripped on through it. He posted it. It would be extremely difficult if she were to back into this and the railing gave way and she just went over. That would explain why she's laying on the ground in the manner that she is. Now, if she went through face first, you could see where a pulse could have inflicted this damage to her um, subdural tissue. But then again, if she went through face first, how did she wind up on her back with her head facing out? I mean, this was not a, uh, an Olympic dive that she was performing here. And we're talking about a 77-year-old woman who weighs 218 pounds. She's got a bad back and then uses a mechanical assistance to walk any distance. It's highly unlikely that she pulled off a Jesse Owens-style sprint here. The social cognitive perspective of the dark triad personality focuses on how individuals with dark triad traits perceive and interact with the social world. It suggests that people exhibiting those traits may have learned manipulative or exploitative behaviors through social interactions or lack of emotional bonding with caregivers. Although Pamela did not have a tough childhood, she did not seem to have a good bond with her parents. Two months ago, my mom got in an accident and we had to put her in a home. I really hate to say it, wanted money, my mom's worth a half a million that I get when she dies. My mom is dementia and doesn't half the time know who we are. Right has been living alone in a condo. And I know that sounds really morbid and stuff like that, but I am a life insurance person. But if I really wanted money, there was an easier way than trying to combat somebody that's physically stronger than me. I'm just saying. People suffering from psychopathy consider themselves superior, which can explain why Pamela could target people who were sick and unwell. Betsy, who had cancer, her own mother Shirley May Newman, who had Alzheimer's, and Louis Gumpenberger, who had limited mental capacity because of a car accident. She disguised herself as a caregiver for the sick and vulnerable, only to harm them later. Her initial act of care made her actions hard to suspect or question. Some people won't. I just don't get it, you know? I just don't get why these people keep coming at me. That's why when I got that money, I never did anything with it. It was like cursed. It's like I don't have anything to do with it. Who likes money? Ain't that much, really? To do crazy shit? 150000 Not really. It's not. Not yeah. in this day and age. No. I just had to buy a new car and it was uh, $30,000. Mm -hmm. like that. I know. 150 dollars I'm buying a squat. No. I mean, obviously it's a good chunk of chain. It is a good chunk of money, but... If someone gave you two, it's great. It's nice. But like I said... It's not, I'm still sitting in the bank. I'm not retiring and stop work because I got hundred fifty thousand. Oh, hell no. That's what my point is. Yeah, it's I not, couldn't even pay off my house. It's not life changing money. Right. Can't even pay off my house. So, but I guess to some people they want it. And I guess I was stupid at the beginning because at the beginning it was like, um, no, it's not what she wanted to do, or she would have done something different. You're not getting it. And then I dug my heels on. It was probably stupid. I should have just gave it away and put the problem on someone else. I don't know. I don't know enough about it, but... I just know people's greed. <laughs> you, a lot of people are greedy people, that's for sure. I don't even know if it's greed. It's like they're, they deserve it. Like it's entitlement, that entitlement, like... Like her daughters wanted it. And I get that. I get it. But you know, she had that policy for 15 years. They were never once on it. She's changed a couple times, but never to them and would never. And Russ was the last one on it. But 
She's changing that because she was leaving him. She did. Like I said, I haven't followed that case too much, but she not have a good relationship with her daughters or something? No. Mm -hmm. She loved her daughters, but they were, um, one was in and out of youth and need and that kind of stuff. Wouldn't be good with the money. No, the one was in youth and need. Yeah, I, she got to get a settlement, $36,000. Gone. You ask them what? You think you buy a car as a young girl? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Party, drugs, booze, that kind of stuff. They're the kind of girls that, when my friend was dying of cancer, that if she didn't give them what they wanted, it would be nothing to say. You're such a bitch, you know, those kind of kids. Right. Bitch. Yeah, that's okay. I said that to her. First, she would have killed me. Right. Second, you just didn't. Right. Yeah, I would. But that was common. Did you did you talk to anybody? Like maybe you didn't like stop and get out of your car necessarily, but did you make any contact with anybody? Um, did you get gas at the gas station? Just that morning. What? At Conoco. Okay, so you got gas and got the Conoco. Yeah, and then gas I got my soda. Okay, yeah. so, mm -hmm. okay. so I talked to the gal at the Conoco because I see her every day. Okay. Didn't stop and talk to anybody else? Okay. Okay. I think that's it. I was just trying to make sure we knew kind of if we could narrow it down just so we could show that you know, you're a Conoco 915, you're a... Yeah. You know. What's that? So. Okay. You need a water or anything? I don't want to remember. Oh, that's yours? Okay. We're working on getting those clothes. Oh, okay. And as soon as we can get, oh, we got clothes. How about that? So, so Ms. Hub, yeah. what we're going to do is I'm going to go get uh, Officer Club again, and then should, we're probably going to have you go in that other room and change out of your clothes. She's going to seize those clothes. Okay. And we, we have your jeans. We got jeans and a shirt for you. So we got some, we got clothes for you. So just hang tight, okay? I'll go get the uh, off the club. Mm -hmm. Let me find out. Have you ever, you ever been arrested before? Traffic offense, traffic warrant, DWI, or anything? No. Nope. Okay. Not that I know of. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, Never been arrested. Okay. The reason I ask we might get your fingerprints, just as we're doing our investigation, and if he's somebody's in your house, elimination prints to kind of separate who's who. The detectives discovered a note and $900 in Lewis's pocket. The note was about kidnapping Pamela and taking Russ's money. The detectives were able to find out that she had lured Lewis to her house, shot him, and left fake evidence. She also tried to kidnap Carol McAfee of mere six days before she shot Lewis dead. So I put a folding pocket knife up this sleeve and a kitchen knife in the front because I'm getting ready to get into a stranger's car that I'm pretty sure, like 99% sure, is up to something illegal. I sat there and I listened to Tim Lomar tell me his version of how he thinks I was supposed to die that day. Talk about leaving you numb from the neck down. It, it's hard, you know, you, you make jokes about it, whatnot, and, but you sit and you think about, she was really gonna kill me. On August 23rd, 2016, Pamela was charged with Lewis Gumpenberger's murder. Now, the question is, what should one do after getting caught? This is Pamela's answer. Do you have the right to remain silent? And they ask her to initial she understands. Officers leave again to try her attorney. You can see we can get all of them. Huff touches her neck, slowly, feeling both sides. You can see how she's thinking about what's next. She knows she's on camera, so she's subtle. Watch this. There's an officer here, a female officer that's going to escort you to the bathroom. Okay. About five minutes pass when you can hear officers yelling. These evidence photos show how she stabbed herself, her neck, both sides, and strikes to both wrists. Too many to count. Pamela Hupp entered an Alford plea, in which she admitted the prosecutors had enough evidence to convict her while still maintaining her innocence. On August 12, 2019, she was given a life sentence in prison without the possibility of parole. Finally, on July 12, 2021, she was charged with the murder of Betsy Faria as well. Any further updates on this case are pending. 
she's been uh, manipulative the whole way. She wants everybody to believe that she's still in control. She lost control and uh, she's never going to have control again. Uh, so I think this was just one more way for her to try to hold on to every last little bit she can. Russ Faria ended up finding a partner in Carol McAfee, who's going to be another victim of Pamela's. Out of all this bad and this bad, bad, evil person, I mean, she's evil incarnate. Um, if it weren't for her, I wouldn't have met this lovely lady here. I think we both make each other pretty happy. And what was the first thing you said to him? I'm sorry about your wife, and I hope you find happiness. Money can sometimes have a profound influence on individuals, pushing them to engage in morally reprehensible actions. Psychopaths, known for their limited capacity to empathize with others, may only truly comprehend the consequences of their actions when they themselves experience suffering. This phenomenon sheds light on why, when apprehended, many murderers opt for death rather than enduring the legal consequences of their deeds. Whether this applies to Pamela or if her attempt to stab herself was merely an attention-seeking ploy is up for debate. What are my charges? Uh, probably four counts of aggravated battery and uh, another count of aggravated I attempted to murder that woman. Well, confer with the state attorney and they don't want to charge attempted murder right now, but if you're adamant, you know, you can always explain that to your defense attorney, but I'm sure they're willing to. No, I want the attempted murder charge. You want the attempted murder charge? Yeah. Well. Because I tried to kill her, and I would like to walk out of here right now. The two don't go hand in hand, okay? What? You can't try to kill people and then just walk free. We fed you on. I can try and kill you. That's not going to go well. Yes, it, it will go well. Yeah. No, I'm not going to sit down. I'm not playing I'm not going to sit down. I'm not playing Have games either. All right. No. I don't want to hurt you. I'm going to kill as many people as I can. That's not going to happen. Okay? Listen, Beatrice, please sit down. We're no. being very nice to you. We're being very nice to you. Tell you no what? one wants to hurt you. If we charge you with the attempt to murder, would you sit down? Yeah. Okay, we'll do that. Then sit down. Okay. What challenges and complexities arise when conducting an interrogation where the suspect is an attorney and also threatens to kill the detective? On February 2nd, 2022, chaos erupted on a peaceful Fort Lauderdale street outside a bustling fresh market. In a shocking turn of events, a seemingly harmless black Kia vehicle transformed into a tool of destruction, striking four unsuspecting individuals, two of whom were mother and daughter Liz and Holly Mineo. Behind the wheel was 31-year-old Beatrice Bijou, whose actions left witnesses bewildered. Traveling at a speed of 35 miles per hour, Beatrice deliberately aimed the car at pedestrians, even reversing at a high rate to target another innocent bystander. Surveillance footage captured this chilling moment, intensifying the horror of the incident. Following the incident, law enforcement officials arrived immediately and Beatrice was taken into custody. While initially charged with aggravated assault, her perplexing immediate reaction upon arrest puzzled the officers. When did that start? I have a gun at my parents' house right now. I got diagnosed with bipolar and schizophrenia. Okay. This captivating video delves into the world of behavioral analysis, meticulously examining and decoding the silent messages conveyed by body language. Unveiling the truth buried within Beatrice's behavior, both the detective and viewers embark on a quest to unravel the truth behind this unforeseen act of violence. How far did you go in school? I'm an attorney. You're an attorney? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, where do you practice? I have my own law firm. Okay. Um, where's that? In Fort Lauderdale. The office is located in Fort Lauderdale. Okay. Beatrice excelled academically graduating with honors in international business from Florida International University in 2012. She furthered her education by obtaining a Doctor of Law degree from Nova Southeastern University in 2016. Establishing the Bijou Law Firm in 2017, Beatrice became a successful managing partner and litigation attorney. However, everything changed on February 2, 2022, when a pivotal event altered the course of her life. Can I get water? Hello? Okay. Okay. You won't 
water, Diet Coke, Sprite, water, water. All right, just give me a second. We'll go get it for you. Okay. Okay. Hey there. Hi. I got a water here for you. I'm going to loosen those handcuffs up a little bit and get you a little bit more comfortable. How does that sound? Sounds good. All right. All good. You good? So what's your name? Beatrice Bijou. How do you say that last name? Bijou. Bijou? Yes. Okay. Right. So let's go ahead and stick your hands. I'm just going to put these on so that they're in front of you. Okay. Just for your safety and my safety. So You want to see it right there? Yeah. All right. Beatrice, my name's George, and I'm one of the people that's just trying to figure out what happened today. All right? Um, before we get started, um, I do have to read Miranda warning because you're sitting here in the police station. Um, and, drinking yeah, water? please, by all means. Um, and, and it's just part of our rules that we have to abide by that. When I have a person sitting here in handcuffs and I want to talk to them and find out what happened, I have to read this and, and we'll go from there, okay? Okay. All right, so we are at the Stewart Police Department. Can I have my phone so I can delete my social media? Well, why don't, why don't we talk about that in a second, okay? Okay. All right. Um, Today's date is 222. Right. So these are your Miranda bits. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in court. You have the right to talk to a lawyer for advice for you. We ask you any questions and to have him with you during questioning. If you do not afford a lawyer, we will be appointed for you before any question if you wish. If you decide to answer questions now without a lawyer present, you still have the right to stop answering at any time. You also have the right to stop answering at any time until you talk to a lawyer. Do you understand what I wrote to you? What was surprising for the detectives was the fact that Beatrice being an attorney herself, didn't ask for an attorney. Perhaps she was confident in her ability to represent herself. Let's move ahead to check. Well, the, we've, we've had a, a big day today. Um, one, one of the things that, that worried me is someone said that you heard voices. What, what, can you tell me about that? Yeah, I've been hearing voices telling me to kill myself and to kill other, other people. When did that start? Beatrice's shocking claims of being compelled by voices to commit violent acts have raised concerns about her mental state. Detectives approach the situation with caution, creating a safe environment to determine the authenticity of her claims. Their objective is to uncover the truth behind Beatrice's mental health and the motivations behind her actions. What, what, can you tell me about that? Yeah, I've been hearing voices telling me to kill myself and to kill other, other people. When did that start? I have a gun at my parents' house right now. Okay. And Where my brother took it away. Okay. He put it in a safe. Okay. I've been trying to kill myself for quite some time. I moved to Texas. And I tried to kill myself in Texas, and it didn't work. I tried to shoot myself, and the gun didn't go off. Okay. And then I tried to do it again. How long ago was that? Last year. Okay. Around April 2021. Okay, so last year in April, you were in Texas. Is, is, is that the first time you tried to kill yourself? Bipolar disorder and schizophrenia are two highly impactful mental health conditions that demand medical intervention and care. 
The symptoms Beatrice mentioned might seem familiar to the average person. So, there's a possible chance that Beatrice is trying to fool the interrogator to believe her claims. I got diagnosed with bipolar and schizophrenia. Okay. When was that diagnosis? 2019. Okay. And it ruined my life. Okay. I've been in and out of mental institutions. Uh -huh. I think this is the last year was the fourth one and they locked me up for an extended period of time. Do you have a physician you see on a regular basis? And who's that? A Kenyeme Abo, 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 Abo. It's a, and he's Nigerian. I, I know he's Nigerian. He's Nigerian. Akinyemi, Dr. Akinyemi. And where does he practice? He practices in Stewart. Okay. Is he a, a psychologist? Or he's a psychiatrist. Psychiatrist. And how long have you been seeing him? I've been seeing him for six months, I think. Okay. No, no, not six months. Four months. Four months. Okay. Is he prescribing any medication? Yes. What does he prescribe? He prescribes me Zebrat, which is G, mm -hmm. and Oxycarbot, which is Trilo. Okay. Oxycarbot, the Trilo is for the bipolar disorder, and the G Zebrat is for the schizophrenia. Okay. Uh, how long have you been taking that medication? four months. Okay. Has it been working for you? No. When was the last time you talked to your doctor? December. Okay. And do, do you know what the date is today? Today is February 22nd. Okay, 100% right. Um, have you told the doctor you didn't think the medication was working well enough? It's quite noticeable how Beatrice took unusually long pauses when asked simple questions like, when did she start her treatment? How long has she been seeing her new psychiatrist? And did she tell her doctor that she thought his medicines were not working on her? However, when it came to more intricate details about her medication, her responses were surprisingly swift. The puzzle of Beatrice's psychology was far from straightforward, and the interrogator maintained a calm demeanor as they continued. Have you been taking your medication as you're supposed to? No. No? No. When was the last time you took your medication? This morning. Okay. What about before that? Before that? I don't know. Okay. But more than a week?
In the ongoing interrogation, the interrogator veers away from the crime-related questions, focusing instead on observing Beatrice's body language and behavior. These cues, such as fidgeting and lack of focus, provide insight into her mental state. The detective relies on Beatrice's words to gain a genuine understanding of the case. However, her conflicting body language and behaviors present unexpected complexities for the detective. What did you do okay. when you got up? When I got up, I went to go take a shower and brush my teeth. Okay. And then what happened? And then I sat in my bed, and I just, I just laid in my bed after that. Okay. And what were you thinking about when you were lying in your bed? To hurt myself and to hurt others. Is that a normal thought for you? Where did that just start today? I hear voices. Okay, what do the voices usually tell you? To kill myself. And is that what the voices usually say? Or did they tell you anything else? Tell me other stuff to, to hurt others. And how long has that been going on? Since I got diagnosed with schizophrenia and bipolar. Okay. Since 2019. Did. So they've been telling you to hurt others for since 2019. Have you ever hurt anybody before? No. No? Today was the first day? Today was the first day. Okay, but they've told you to hurt people before. Why was today different? I just lost it. Did something trigger you? The interrogators in this case pay close attention to small details to uncover the truth. They notice Beatrice's behaviors like constantly being thirsty and talking about hearing voices telling her to be violent. These signs indicate she may be experiencing psychosis, a symptom commonly seen in people with schizophrenia. Using their sharp deduction skills, the investigators correctly determine that the crime was a result of the episode Beatrice was experiencing. Can I speak to a lawyer? You have the right to speak to an attorney. Okay. We'll end it for now. Do you have an attorney in mind that you would like to call? Hmm? Do you have an attorney in mind that you would like to call? No. Okay. If you change your mind, you can always talk to me again, okay? Just want you to sit tight for a little while. Talking. You want to keep talking? Yeah. Okay. You you requested an attorney. Are you waiving that right again? You you, you invoke the right to an attorney. I just want to be very clear that you're waiving your I right. I just lost it today. Okay. Is there something that happened? I'm going to turn this back on. I'm going to turn it back on because you're requesting to talk to me. Okay? Is that fair? This is George McClain. President is Chris Bajou.
Beatrice was clearly confused and also overwhelmed, but she tried to compose herself and be present in the moment. This behavior directly reflects the state of confusion, which is often observed in individuals with bipolar disorder. Shifting from a state of manic to a very rational state also has an association with schizophrenia. In the upcoming section, investigators are about to encounter an unprecedented incident that will significantly alter the trajectory of Beatrice Bijou's case. I don't want to take my own life right now. Oh, that's not good. And I would like to talk to you. Um, but like I said, when you... Can I speak to a doctor? We're probably going to get you a doctor to talk to. Um, at, at least to start with. Um, but as far as Miranda goes, and my knowledge of the law, you're not entitled to speak to a doctor now. You are entitled to a lawyer, if that's what you would like. I'm willing to talk to you, and it will help us determine... I'm afraid. What are you afraid of? I don't know. I'm just afraid right now. Okay. I'm going to read this last sentence again, okay? I want you to listen to what I'm, what I'm saying. If you decide to answer questions now without a lawyer, you can still have the right to stop at any time. Do you understand that? Okay, so you can say stop, I want my lawyer. I don't want to answer anymore. You also have the right to stop answering at any time until you talk to a lawyer. So, what I'm saying is, if you'd like to continue talking with me, I'm willing to listen to you. I also have questions I'd like to ask you. If you do not want to talk to me, if you want your lawyer present, I'm not going to ask you any more questions, and I'm not going, I'm not going to talk to you because I don't want to violate your rights. Okay? So, what do we want to do? Do you want to talk a little bit more? Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Just okay. a little bit. Whenever you don't want to talk, just tell me, okay? Okay. All right. The interrogator astutely observes Beatrice's self-harm tendencies and handled the situation with care and patience. Rather than pressuring her, they provided a safe space for conversation, emphasizing the importance of avoiding self-harm. The interrogator also respected Beatrice's rights by affirming her choice to remain silent, prioritizing her comfort and freedom during the process. Yeah. What are my charges? Uh, probably four counts of aggravated battery and uh, another count of aggravated Okay. Okay. I attempted to murder that woman. Well, confer with the state attorney and they don't want to charge attempted murder right now. But if you're adamant, you know, you can always explain that to your defense attorney, but I'm sure they're willing to. No, I want the attempted murder charge. You want the attempted murder charge. Yeah. Well, you will have an opportunity for first appearance, and you can explain that to the judge. Okay. All right? All right. Because I tried to kill her. We have, we have, we are documenting. And I would like to walk out of here right now. Well, the, the two don't go hand in hand. Okay? What? You can't try to kill people and then just walk free. So, we fed you lunch. I can try and kill you. That's not going to go well. Yes, it, it will go well. Yeah. No, I'm not going to sit down. I'm not playing I'm not going to sit down. I'm not playing games seat. either. All right. No. I don't want to hurt you. I'm going to kill as many people as I can. That's not going to happen. Okay? Listen, Beatrice. Beatrice, please sit down. 
We're no. being very nice to you. We're being very nice to you. Tell you no what, one wants to hurt you. If we charge you with the attempted murder, would you sit down? Yeah. Okay, we'll do that. Then sit down. Okay. Okay. Right. Thank Take you. care of it. We'll change. We'll change the charge. This sudden change in behavior is a common sign of bipolar disorder, characterized by shifts from calmness to aggression. The interrogator quickly recognized this aggression through Beatrice's body language and tone. It's important to note that anger and aggressive behavior and quick shifts to calmness are often common manifestations of psychosis. Interrogators gathered vital information about the case, but had more to do. They prioritized Beatrice's well-being and then contacted her sister and boyfriend to verify her claims. Tassa Epsidy, Beatrice Bijou's sister, was thus interrogated on the evening of the same date. So we're from Stewart, born and raised. Um, I didn't know anything about this. I just know that my sister, she suffers a mental condition. Um, she graduated from, she graduated from Nova University. With a law degree. With a law degree. She has a law firm in Fort Lauderdale. She had, um, she's been hospitalized multiple times. She's also been hospitalized in Texas. I've flown to Texas. How did she end up in Texas? We were all kind of wondering yeah. how that happened. Um, she just ran up, got up, and said, I'm moving to Texas. She literally, I guess that's one of the signs of your illness. Sometimes you just do like random things. Yeah. So she randomly got up and moved to Texas. And I've been mostly the person that's been behind my sister this entire time. So I've flown out to Texas many times, Dallas, Texas. I've been to the hospital. This was during COVID. They weren't, we weren't able, I wasn't able to see her, mm -hmm. but I had to fly out, get her car, because she was having um, episodes. So I, I think this is another episode because she posted on Facebook that she was, well, she's in a relationship. So she posts on Facebook that she's engaged. So I was like, okay, cool. Like he's cool, they, they have a good relationship. I don't know what happened, but I know that she's having a mental um, episode and uh -huh. jail sh right now she needs to be in like a stable place but she shouldn't be in jail she should be in the um what is it called again new horizons yeah. new horizons tassa's demeanor and eye contact indicated her honesty beatrice's admission and tassa's statement confirmed her struggles with severe mental health issues and multiple hospitalizations we no criminal background my sister wouldn't touch a soul my sister would, like, somebody would fight her, she would go, like, she would literally put her hands up. My sister is a good person. So this is like... Take note of the unwavering steadiness in Tassa's voice as she describes her sister, Beatrice. Such consistency in tone often accompanies individuals who speak truthfully. The investigators had a twofold objective. First, to ascertain the authenticity of Beatrice's claims during her interrogation and second, to uncover the underlying cause that triggered her violent outburst, which put the lives of four pedestrians at risk. Do you, you know about her condition? Uh, she, she told us a little bit, um, but I didn't actually get to talk to her all too much today. Okay, did she, re like, from her voice, she said that she was trying to kill them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? That, that I heard, yeah. To, said it to the I, yeah, she said it multiple, multiple times. On the same day, to further pursue this line of inquiry, Kyle, Beatrice's boyfriend, became the focus of the next interrogation. Okay, you guys went to church on Sunday or Saturday? No, it's Sunday. Okay, yeah, we went to church. And that's when she was acting a little, little. Well, late. well, her, um, like, she was just like, and then the next day when she was at her parents, because like she's, we have our location shared. She was like home all day. At her parents okay the next day you know and I'm, and I'm just like you know she's my woman and i'm like i can't i can't you know like whatever condition but i you know i, I can lead a horse to water but it's up to you right. to drink it yeah. and i you know with god telling me and prophesied to me about this woman she's a beautiful woman she's one of a kind she has a great heart she has a, she's passionate and she definitely knows what she's she's she owns a freaking law firm who uh -huh. who can have <laughs> a, a condition so when these medications She's on antipsychotic medications and bipolar medications. 
Triliptal is one of them, I'm pretty sure. No, the other one. And the other, uh, that one's, I think it's like anti-seizure medication and it's, you know, helps for like uh, mood swings. So, uh -huh. they, you know, do that for the bipolar. And then she's on the antipsychotic medication. And, you know, personally, um, you know, with the antipsychotic medication, if you're taking medication and, you know, because it rewires your brain, these antipsychotic medications, right? Mm -hmm. And if she stopped taking them, what's, what's going to happen? Um, so she told you why she wanted to stop taking them? Was it oh, she was oh, 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 yeah, so, 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 you know, when um, she was, uh, she went and saw the doctor, uh, the gyno, uh, what's it, kind of, uh, gynecologist? Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, she went and saw the doctor, and she got checked out, she don't have anything wrong with her. Okay. Um, you know, and with the the medicine that she told me, like the doctor said, like, uh, I, I can't be taking medication while trying to get pregnant. Through further conversation, interrogators keenly observed Kyle's behavior. They noted that he provided detailed descriptions of their relationship and maintained consistent eye contact, both indicators commonly associated with truthfulness. This observation added credibility to his words and lent weight to the authenticity of his account. Do you have any questions for us? What's, so what's, what's going to happen? Like, what's... Uh, she got transported to the jail. Um... That she right now probably doesn't have a bond. I think she'll probably go to first appearance. They'll 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 sign a bond and all that. Um, but I I don't know if today was just a really bad day or if something happened today to kind of trigger her or set her off. I, that's I just uh, why like she like the whole time we've been together like I I would have saw something right yeah. like 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 all of a sudden like you know what I mean like pull out a like a weapon trying to hit me. Right, and even right, I didn't even, see any of that. Even in an argument, she never said, like, I want to kill you, I want to kill nope. myself, I want to Nope, kill you. nope, never. She wouldn't even hurt a fly. I swear to you. She wouldn't even hurt a fly. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, so I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know I what just, happened like, today. But something, something set her off or triggered her today, apparently. So like what, what's the process? Tell me the process of this. Um, so she she got arrested today. She she got booked into the jail. She'll be in the jail until she bonds out. Um, Kyle's face reveals his deep emotional impact as he realizes the severity of Beatrice's mental health struggles, which he'd been unaware of. Overwhelmed by a sense of helplessness, he grapples with the painful reality that the woman he deeply cares for is being consumed by mental illness. Well, Todd, based on a report by a medical doctor, the state agreed this afternoon that Beatrice Bijou was not guilty by way of insanity when she plowed her vehicle into a group of people outside a Stewart grocery store back in February. Now, Bijou appeared before a judge Friday afternoon in handcuffs, an orange jumpsuit, and her hair back in tight buns. She appeared lucid but stoic. She's been held without bond since February when police say she slept slammed her black Kia into a table outside a fresh market, backed up, then went after a witness who followed her and went after her. In total, four people were injured. When, co when cops caught up to Bijou, they say she admitted to the act right away, saying that voices in her head told her to, quote, kill the people. She was facing four counts of attempted murder. But today, she was agitated by way of insanity. She stood and nodded to the judge while he gave the ruling and never made eye contact with her victims, including Holly Mineo, who was grabbing lunch with her mom, Liz, when Bijou plowed her car into them, severely injuring them both. Things will never be the same for us. You know, we both have injuries. Um, uh, you know, walking out near traffic or eating lunch somewhere, it's always on my mind every single day. What I want to tell her is accept the help. It is being offered to her. Accept the help. Take it. Just take it for yourself. Through a thorough analysis of Beatrice's signs and body language during the interrogation, it becomes evident that she was going through a psychosis episode. Her behavior and body language aligned with the patterns commonly observed in individuals experiencing psychosis. The case of Beatrice Bijou highlights the importance of being aware of mental health in investigations. 
necessitating skilled investigators, safe environments, and effective techniques. It exposes the intricacies of mental health and the unpredictability of violence, emphasizing the need for thorough investigation to uncover the truth. What did you think of the interrogation of Beatrice Bijou? Let us know in the comments down below. And if there's a case you'd like us to cover, do let us know that as well. For more such content, like, share, and subscribe to our channel.